All right, good evening. <clears throat> We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order at 7.01 p.m. Monday, June the 20th, and certainly want to welcome all of you that are here for us this evening. If we could just take a moment for silent meditation, please. Thank you. Madam Clerk, I'm going to ask Jose Councilman Davis to lead us in the pledge. Madam Clerk, if you call the roll, please. Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. Councilmember Davis. Councilmember Johnson. Councilmember Moffitt. Councilmember Reese. Here. And Councilmember Shule. Uh, we have um, several resolutions that we'd like to present this evening. I'm going to first call on the Mayor Pro Tem, uh, followed by Councilman Moffitt. Good evening. I am honored to present a resolution memorializing Angela Bandora Langley and I would ask that her family join me. Every member who's here. And it reads, whereas Angela Van Doren Langley, lovingly known as Angie, was born in Durham, North Carolina on May 27, 1961, to Gloria L. Kearney and Samuel Kearney, and whereas Angela was a proud graduate of the Hillside High School class of 1980, and went on to further her education at North Carolina Central University, earning a Bachelor of Arts degree in elementary education in May 1984, as well as a Master's in Agency Counseling in December 1995, and while there was elected Miss Junior. In 2006, she received a Certificate in Professional Activity Specialist or Senior Programming at Durham Technical Community College. And whereas, upon finishing college, Angela worked for the North Carolina Department of Health Services as a rehabilitation counselor with the Independent Living Rehabilitation Program, assisting individuals with severe physical disabilities in maintaining independent living in their homes and the community. And Whereas, at an early age, Angela joined First Calvary Baptist Church, where she loved praising the Lord and often expressed her faith through journal entries of sermons and scriptures that were preached during church. And, whereas Angela, recognizing the family was so precious, evident of the strong love she had for her son Brad and her three beautiful granddaughters, Navea, Savannah, Paris, Maria, and Winter Snow, who provided such inspiration for her life. And whereas, Angela's strong conviction for being that voice who advocated tirelessly for children, persons with disabilities, affordable and accessible housing, efficient government services, and responsible economic development, improving the quality of life for all citizens led her to serve as a member of the Durham City Council from 1995 to 2001. And 
whereas Angela was the executive producer and host of the Disability Empowerment Project, aired on Channel 8. Use this tool as a platform to encourage, inform, and educate the public on the lives of persons with disabilities. And through her constant caring for others, Angela volunteered with the Senior Life Program at the Community Family Life and Recreation Center at Lyon Park and was involved with Greater Joy Baptist Church Choir Executive Board the Big Sister Program, Liaison for Disabled Tenants in Public Housing, Kappa Alpha Psi Sweetheart, co-founder of Willing to Save My Brother, Partners Against Crime, District 3, Lion Park Neighborhood Association, and whereas Angela's professional affiliations and awards included the National Association for Independent Living, Durham Area Transit Authority, recipient of the Triangle Access Award in 2004, Data Link Paratransit Advisory, Mayor's Committee for Persons with Disabilities, Protective Services of the Department of Social Services, the Developmental Disabilities Council, and most recently, she was appointed by Durham Public Schools to serve as a surrogate parent representing students with disabilities in IEP meetings whose parents were either unknown or unavailable. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Durham City Council. Number one, that this City Council pauses in a moment of silence in memory of Angela Van Doren Langley. that this governing body pays tribute to the life of Angela Van Doren Langley and the contribution she made to the city of Durham, not just for the disabled, but for all people. That this resolution be spread upon the official minutes of this governing body. And number four, that a certified copy of this resolution be presented to the family of Angela Angie Van Doren Langley. I.D. Ann Gray, duly appointed city clerk of the city of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby certify that the above resolution is true and accurate, which is adopted by the city council at its regular city council work session held on Thursday, June 9th, 2016. And it's signed by William V. Bill Bell, Mayor D. Ann Gray, our city clerk. Who do I give this to? <laughs> yeah. I'm Destiny Quick, and Angie was a very special person to me because she always helped me. She always took care of me when my mom was at work, and she always was just a wonderful person. She helped everybody in the community. And Angie Langley is just the kindest, most sweetest person that I have ever known. Thank you. <laughs> Destiny said it all. Thank you. While Councilman Moffitt is coming forth, this is a supplemental <clears throat> item, a resolution that uh, Don will speak to, and it's item 55, a resolution of condolence and support following the massacre at Pulse in Orlando, Florida, and at an appropriate time after Don is read it, recognize the council to adopt the resolution. Councilman Moffitt. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Um, in this, uh, Sunday's edition of the News and Observer, uh, Timothy McNair uh, wrote uh, about being African American and since the age of 16 openly gay. He wrote extensively about the additional burdens of being both gay and of color 
and pointed out in his essay that the victims of the shooting in Orlando were overwhelmingly black and brown. One only needs listen to the names of the killed read aloud to realize how many were Latinx, which is the non-gender term in use for both men and women. I'm proud of Durham's embrace of diversity and happy to offer tonight's resolution on behalf of the entire city council. Whereas the city of Durham has been and continues to be a community that embraces the diversity of humankind, and whereas the city of Durham is committed to residents' ability to enjoy their life without fear of harassment or discrimination due to their race, color, religion, sex, national origin, political affiliation or belief, age, disability, sexual orientation, or gender identity. And whereas one place of refuge for the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer community where they could safely be themselves has long been bars and nightclubs such as Pulse in Orlando, Florida. Whereas Pulse was opened 12 years ago by Barbara Poma to honor her deceased brother and named for his heart and served as a community hub for HIV prevention, breast cancer awareness, and immigrant rights. And whereas on June 12th of this year, in Orlando, Florida, a gunman without reason or provocation entered Pulse and massacred 49 people and grievously injured another 53 people. And whereas we abhor gun violence, and whereas this attack specifically targeted the LGBTQ community and the Latinx community, and whereas we value and support all peaceful people, and especially at this time, our LGBTQ community and the Latinx community. Therefore, be it now resolved by the City Council of the City of Durham, North Carolina, that the city grieves for those killed and wounded. And be it further resolved that we offer our condolences to the residents of the City of Orlando and the members of the LGBTQ community and the Latinx community there. And be it further resolved that we, firm, we affirm our commitment to embracing diversity and be it further resolved that we offer our support from members of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer community and Latinx community everywhere, and especially here in Durham. Let it be spread far and wide that people everywhere shall know our support and embrace for all members of our community, especially on this day, the members of our LGBT community and the Latinx community. And it's uh, certified by um, the clerk and duly signed by uh, William Bill Bell, the mayor of the city of Durham. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Councilman Moffitt. I would entertain a motion, adoption of the resolution is read. So moved. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded, Madam Clerk. Will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. I'd like to recognize the Mayor Pro Tem. Can I go down the yeah. Good evening again. This is a resolution uh, that I brought forth a few meetings ago, but it was not read, and I think it's important enough that it should be read uh, so that. The public will understand that we do support uh, our young African-American males as well. And it reads, whereas young men generally and African-American males specifically are dying at an alarming rate due to homicides, which is the number two cause of death for all males and the number one cause of death for 15 to 24-year-old African-American males, and whereas research documents that daily exposure to violence among men generally and African-American males specifically impacts traumatically and forever changes the lives of these youths and their families. And whereas the loss of African-American males in the community as a result of homicide and high rates of incarceration further impacts the community by reducing the number of males who may serve as role models for young African American males. And whereas the city, in our efforts to prevent violence and address the root causes, therefore, thereof, 
will continue to support the following programs. Year-round city programming, Office on Youth Teen, Cent Youth Teen Center, Durham Youth Commission, Durham Parks and Recreation Teen Programming, Southside Youth Leadership Program, Police Athletic League, Police Explorer Program, Water Conservation Educational Programming, Seasonal City Programming, Durham Parks and Recreation Summer Camps, Durham Youth Work Internship Program, and Job Readiness Workshops, the Junior Fire Marshal Program, Gang Resistance Education and Training, that is the GREAT Program, Summer Camps, City Participation, Gang Reduction Strategy Project Bill, Becoming, Building Every Chance of Making It Now and Grown Up, the Junior Leadership Durham Program, the Justice Involved Program, and the Mayor's Poverty Reduction Initiative. And whereas only increased local attention to this matter can reduce the violence that plagues many young males generally, and African American males specifically, be it resolved that the City of Durham will continue to call for a holistic intervention approach designed to address the violence among males generally and young African American males specifically, and be it further reserved that resolved that the City of Durham supports short and long-term strategies to bring peace back to the Afri African American community in a way that promotes the longevity of the lives of African American males. And while I'm standing, let me please plead to everyone who can to mentor a young black boy. Be a positive role mo model. Give some time and you will see a great change in this community. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. I entertain a motion to adopt the resolution as read. So moved. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? <coughs> Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. All right, thank you. Let me ask are there any announcements by members of the council recognize Councilman Moffitt. Mr. Mayor, it's my understanding that this morning we lost another one of our lions in the battle for civil rights. And um, so I understand that Ann Atwater passed this morning. And I would ask that we take a moment of silence to remember the, the, the energy, the sheer energy that she brought to her battle for social justice, make Durham a place where everyone is uh, treated fairly and with dignity. Thank you. Thanks, Don. I recognize Councilman Shule. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we have another uh, resolution uh, on the consent agenda, the resolution in support of the Faith ID of Durham. And uh, this resolution supports the uh, El Centro Hispano, uh, the Immaculate Conception Church, other churches, and the Durham Police Department who have worked together to create this ID so that people without identification in our community will have some identification for uh, when they encounter police officers or uh, other, of, other of our local institutions. Um, the legislature, we used to recognize the matricula consular, the legislature made that illegal. Uh, so I just want to thank our local institutions and our police for endorsing our own local form of ID uh, and I, I want to just ask uh, Pilar Rocha Goldberg, who I believe is here, if she would stand, the director of El Centro, uh, and just say thank you very much, Pilar. I thought you were going to read it. Do you want me to make it? Yeah, if you don't mind. Can you state the number? The, the resolution uh, yes, that the Mr. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem did was 46. You might. Uh, this is item seven, resolution support of faith ID of Durham, and I will move the item. It's been properly moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? And close the vote. 
It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Are, are there any other announcements recognized? Uh, Councilman Reese, followed by the Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this past June 16th, this past Thursday, my wife and I had the opportunity to attend a screening of a film at the Carolina Theater called Love Is All You Need. It was an incredibly powerful film uh, that uses a narrative twist that I won't give away to help uh, those of us who are not um, LGBTQ understand what young people go through when they come out uh, and when they finally start to realize who uh, they love and who they're going to be. And I encourage, uh, it's not yet in wide release, uh, but I encourage when it does uh, come out in wide release, I encourage everyone to go see it for a deeper understanding of, of how young people in this community uh, can be victimized by hate. Um, and uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that this was at the Carolina Theater, uh, that they uh, sponsored it as a fundraiser for a group called uh, Safe Schools NC. And I just want to thank the Carolina Theater for being an active and vibrant part of this community. Um, and I want to thank the city council, especially the city manager, for his, uh, his special attention to the needs of the Carolina Theater over the last year. And um, it makes a difference. Thank you. Shall I recognize the mayor pro tem? Um, I would like to thank all the organizations who are focusing attention on our young people. It will make a difference, and I still plead to people to be mentors. Do something to help our children. Many of them are from uh, families that are not structured, uh, families that are having some problems. So it's up to us to help save a generation of children. I plead with you to help somebody. I know we have a lot of protests about a whole lot of things, but if I could protest tonight, it would be because we don't do enough for our children. We need to do more for our children. We need to do more for our children. I'll say it 10,000 times if I have to. That's the only way things will change. Don't focus on us. Don't focus on yourself. Focus on the children. They are our future. Well, they are, they are our right now. We've got to do something to help them. Can I get an amen right there? Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, there, there were a lot of things that were happening this weekend. Pause. In fact, we've had this past few weekends have been great, great weather, great functions. The community Ram band was down in, community bands were down at the Durham Central Park. Um, you had Juneteenth, and you had, I guess, an event over in North East Central Durham on Driver Street, where I understand there was great attendance at both, all, all the events. Uh, and speaking about North East Central Durham, the community Center for Documentary Studies has done a video of different sections of North East Central Durham talking to different residents in, in that community. And they will have a CD screening of this video on Saturday, June the 25th at 10.30 a.m. And it will be at the Full Frame American Tobacco Campus Theater. Uh, if any of you know what American Tobacco Campus is, uh, if you go on the campus, you'll probably be able to find the Full Frame Theater. Uh, the public is invited, and again, it's at 10.30 a.m. And it's sponsored by the Center for Documentary Studies. Uh, if that concludes all of the announcements, we'll move to the priority items. First, recognize the city manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. I have two uh, supplemental items, which are priority items this evening, then an announcement. Uh, general uh, agenda item number 53, zoning map change, Cornwallis Road property, uh, Z150031. Uh, this is a supplemental item carryover from the June 5th, June 6th, uh, 2016 City Council meeting. And then agenda item number 54, the FY 2016-17 non-exempt pay structure adjustment recommendation. Uh, those are the two supplemental items. And I did want to report, uh, as you recall, at the last meeting we had significant uh, problems with the microphones and some issues with voting. Uh, unfortunately, um, those issues are not completely resolved at this point. Uh, we anticipate uh, hopefully taking care of that over the summer break. But it is possible this evening uh, that uh, some of the, uh, the microphones may malfunction. Uh, we would ask the council members speak uh, directly into the microphone uh, because we are not experiencing the problem in what's going out over the air, just what's in this room. 
So if you can uh, speak into the microphone, uh, even if it doesn't seem like it's working, uh, that will be helpful. And then, um, uh, again, we'll just have to play it by ear, see how the, uh, the voting uh, screen works. So far, so good, but uh, that may, may have issues during the night as well. We apologize for that, but uh, trying to get on top of it, it's just gotten to be a little more complicated than we anticipated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, entertain a motion on the city manager's prior items. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passed to seven to zero. Thank you. Recognize the city attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. Likewise, recognize the city clerk. No items, Mr. Mayor. Uh, in that case, we'll proceed with the agenda as printed. And probably most of you know that the first item is a consent agenda, and consent agenda items may be approved with a single vote. If a council member or a member of the audience chooses to pull on a consent agenda item, uh, we'll discuss that later in the program. And I'll just read the heading of each one of the consent agenda items. Item one is approval of city council minutes. Item two is the mayor's nominee for a reappointment to Durham Open Space and Trails Commission. Item three is the mayor's nominee for a reappointment to the Human Relations Commission. Item four is FY 2015-16 amendments to the budget ordinance, grant project ordinance, and internal service fund spending plans. Item five is the fiscal year 2016-2017 budget and 2017-22 capital improvement plan, and I'll pull that item. Item Item seven is resolution in support of faith ID of Durham. I just did that one. And item eight is proposed FY17 planning department work program, and I'll pull that item. Item nine is Durham bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission annual report. Item 10 is the contract with Stewart Engineering Inc. for the development of the Duke Beltline Trail Master Plan. Item 11 is interlocal agreement for Regional Transit Information Center. Item 12 is the ordinance amending section 70-57, payment of water, sewer, and stormwater bills in section 70-5, obstruction of water meters. Item 13 is Water Regulatory Compliance Engineering Design Services Contract, Amendment Number 5, Black and Veatch International Company. Item 14 is Brown and Williams Water Treatment Plant Expansion and Upgrades Project, Construction Contract Award to Crowder Construction Company. Item 15 is Eno Economic Development District Water and Sewer Systems Project, Amendment Number 2 for Professional Engineering Services, CDM Smith, Inc. Item 16 is Supplemental Article Number 7, Compendium of Raw Water Sources for Jordan Lake Partners. Item 17 is City County Radio System Service Agreement Renewal with Motorola Sol Solutions, Inc. Item 18 is Aquatic, Aquatic Facilities Master Plan Professional Services Contract with Ratio Architects, Inc. Item 21 is Contract for Community Partnerships, Inc. to provide Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act Youth Framework Services from July 1, 2016 to June 30, 2017. Item 22 is a contract with Achievement of Cabinet of Durham to provide Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act Youth Employment Element Services from July 1, 2016. Yeah. To, to, yeah. I, I, item 22 is a contract with Achievement Academy of Durham to provide Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act Youth Program Element Services from July 1, 2016 to June 30, 2017. Item 24 is a contract for the provision of pre-employment psychological testing. Item 25 is a contract for the provision of police psychological services, and I'll pull that item. Item 26 is a award of contract for debris removal and management services. Item 27 is the water contract for debris removal monitoring services. Item 28 is in a local agreement with Durham County for processing and hauling of recyclable materials. Items 29 through 38 are items that can be found on the general business agenda as public hearings. Item 46 is a resolution in support of action by the city of Durham addressing violence among young African American males. We've had that adopted. Item 27 is this item can be found on the general business agenda as public hearings. Item 40. Eight is appointment confirmation to the Civilian Police Review Board. 
I should have pulled item 26, 46. You might have asked for it, Ms. Peterson, but you didn't sign up for it. Did you say 26 or 46? Okay, that's the one that we've already acted on. Um, yeah, we just did. We just did. We just did. Let, let, let's move on. We just did. Item 47 is an item that can be found on the general business agenda as public hearings. Item 48 is appointment confirmation to the Civilian Police Review Board. Item 49 is amendment to building and services agreement between the City of Durham and the Carolina Theater of Durham, Inc. Item 51 is a contract with Educational Data Systems, Inc. to operate Durham's NC Works Career Center and to provide Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act Adult and Dislocated Worker Services from July 1, 2016 to June 30, 2017. Item 15, 52 is North Carolina Institute of Minority and Economic Development Building Basement and Renovations Contract Award, ST-259. Uh, that concludes the consent agenda items. I would, just a minute, please. I will entertain a motion for the approval of the consent agenda items with exception of five Eight, twenty-five, and it's fifty-four. Fifty-four. Okay. Madam, 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 Ms. Peterson, I'm conducting the meetings. I, I heard your request. What I've said that that action has already been taken. At the appropriate time, I'll recognize you, but not now. I entertain a motion for the. Approval of consent agenda items. It's been properly moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Will you open the vote? Will you close the vote? It, Ms. Peterson, no one said you couldn't speak. I'm saying the action has been taken. Seven to zero. Okay. Uh, that concludes the. Did you say something, Madam Perkin? Oh, okay. That, that concludes the consent agenda items. Fifty-two. Yeah, I have fifty-two. Okay. Huh? Yeah. Item 54, which is a supplemental item, is fiscal year 2016-2017, non-exempt pay structure adjustments recommendation. Mr. Mayor, uh, this is an item that uh, we had to uh, wait until the council had the budget uh, 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 discussion regarding the implementation of the uh, uh, three-year implementation of the $15 an hour uh, minimum wage as well as the uh, preparing for the structural adjustments to the pay plan and uh, so it is something that uh, needs council action this evening uh, so that it can be uh, we can begin that implementation July the 1st I'll offer a motion that we move that item sir unless it's been properly moved and second is there any discussion on an item here and call the question madam clerk will you open the vote Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Okay, we'll move back to the agenda items and general business agenda, public hearings, item twenty nine, conference plan amendment, Witherspoon Garrett, A fifteen zero 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 two three. Good evening. I'm Grace Smith with the Planning Department, and before I introduce that item, I can affirm that all legal notice requirements have been executed in accordance with state and local law for all Planning Department public hearing items, and affidavits for such are on file in the Planning Department. So um, for the Witherspoon Garrett case, A15-00023, Plan Amendment case, it's a request to change the future land use designation from office to low density residential on a portion of the 4.5 acre tract located at 4800 Garrett Road. The existing recreation open space designation, which is approximately 0.30 acres, will not be changed. 
Staff recommends approval based on consideration of adopted plans, compatibility, impacts, and site dimensions as outlined in Unified Development Ordinance Section 3.47 criteria. Planning Commission voted to approve this case by a vote of 11 to 2 on April 12, 2016. And staff is available if you have any questions. And this is a public hearing. Staff has made this report. I would ask first other questions by members of the council on this item. Is anyone in the audience who wants to speak on this item, this being a public hearing? Yes, sir, if you would come forward and just state your name and address. This is item 29. I have Dexter Smith, yes. Yes, I am Margaret Dex Cameron, uh, John Kent, and Dan Jewell. Uh, and let, let, me, let me do this first. We have three people that want to speak in support of this item, one that wants to speak as an opponent. Let me ask, is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item, either opponent or proponent? If not, we will hear the proponents first, and uh, given the amount of time we have here, let's take 10 minutes, 12 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll go since I'm representing the applicant. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the council. My name is Dan Jewell with Coulter Jewell Thames. Uh, 111 West Main Street. We've been asked by the Pike family, uh, we have them here tonight, uh, David Pike, Rhonda Witherspoon Pike, and Taylor Pike, uh, to help them with the relocation of their business, Witherspoon Rose Culture, from Watkins Road, where it's been long established, to the, this proposed location, which is the former Yates Baptist Association headquarters on Garrett Road, which is now empty. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with Witherspoon Rose. They are providers of a premium rose garden service and rose garden supplies and are a third generation family owned business that have been based here in Durham for 65 years now. They and their 30 employees are dedicated to family values and making Durham a better and more beautiful place. Our requests this evening are for a plan amendment, which is the case before you uh, tonight, to a less intensive designation, and of course office uh, to residential, and a, and a down zoning from office to rural residential. Witherspoon has been at their current location for nearly 60 years. In my over 30 years in Durham, I've seen their neighborhood change from being completely rural to now being smack dab in the middle of Patterson Place, surrounded by hotels, stores, offices, apartments and literally right across the street from the proposed Patterson Place light rail station. Uh, they feel it is time to relocate but they do not want to go far and they have found this site which is literally three quarters of a mile as the crow flies from where they are today so they're in the light right neighborhood. Uh, by every measure what what we are proposing is a less intensive land use, both from a, uh, a future land use map standpoint and a zoning standpoint, than what would be allowed under the current land use designation. That goes to traffic, building height, water use demands, schools, et cetera, et cetera. Those of you who are familiar with the site know that it is already uh, partially developed, so the new development won't, will only be incrementally more than what is out there today, rather than starting with a brand new site. Uh, a few key points, we are committed to staying out of the identified New Hope Creek bottomlands area to the southwest corner of the site, that's, that's shown on the plan. Uh, that area does contribute to a contiguous amount of green space uh, at the base of what probably 30 years ago was a stump and construction dump. If you've been out there, there's a huge mountain, probably one of the biggest uh, topographic reliefs in, in, in Durham that is uh, still maintained on, on the top. But between the New Hope Creek bottom land area that we are committed to maintaining and a buffer around the edge of the site, we will be able to maintain a, a wildlife corridor around the back of this property. Uh, also, keep in mind that there are no stormwater management measures in place today, and of course, the new development will have to install those to meet the Jordan Lake requirements. Uh, finally, please also consider that by relocating here, eight acres of real estate will be freed up right next door to the planned Patterson Place light rail station, providing a golden opportunity for a transit supportive development which of course will require rezoning, which of course you will get to review in the future when that comes before you. Uh, in closing, 
we hope you will agree that the advantage to allowing Witherspoon to relocate to this site with the benefits stated above, including less intensive uses and stormwater management and New Hope bottomlands protection that does not exist today is worthy of granting this request. And of course, we are happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you. You've heard the uh, opponents. I have two other persons that have signed to speak on this item. I'd recognize them if they still would like to speak. Uh, Marguerite Cameron and Dexter Smith, in that order. Mayor, members of council, we'll make this very brief. Um, Mr. Jewell pretty well summed it up, I think. Could, I could you state your name again, please? Dexter Smith. Okay. Uh, I believe Mr. Jewell pretty well summed it up, but I would just uh, add a, a comment or two. Basically, as you know, if you've been there, you've seen that on Garrett Road, this is pretty much the end of a, what is almost a commercial strip uh, pretty well on both sides of the road. Um, and it is in a, um, a area that uh, adjoins the uh, Fred Astaire Dance Studio, if many of you recognize that as a, it's kind of an old landmark. Uh, many of the uses there have evolved over time, of course. And um, the, uh, uh, I too, along with Mr. Jewell, have assisted the, the Pike family and uh, the uh, Pike Witherspoon family, if you will, uh, in this process and believe that it is a very compatible use. I don't know who doesn't like roses. Thank you. Welcome. Recognize. Mrs. Smith. Mrs. Smith, could you come back? She has a question. Hi, are you the Dexter Smith? Who, uh, yes, who with I remember. Government? I remember Cora. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's from good to see you. Our old days. Good to see you, Miss Cameron. I'm Marguerite Cameron, and uh, I work with Dexter uh, at Berkshire Hathaway, and I've known the Witherspoon Pike family for some time now and have sold several of them a home, which was great. I don't think they would do anything uh, to make a problem for the city, and they certainly have beautified it. And I think the location is probably one of the best they could have found. So we hope that you'll approve that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, <coughs> let me recognize Mr. John Kent. Mr. Kent, present. Mr. Kent is speaking in, as an opponent, so he has 14 minutes. That, that's correct. Uh, my name is John Kent, uh, 394 Cub Creek Road, Chapel Hill. Uh, I've been involved with the New Hope Creek Corridor Advisory Committee for 25 years. I've also done water quality monitoring in New Hope Creek at six sites monthly for 25 years. Um, what bothers me about this is we have an adopted New Hope Creek corridor um, plan uh, and we're changing open space unless since the planning commission meeting uh, the proposal has changed. Uh, we're changing open space recreation um, to something else and we're uh, proposing to put uh, agriculture in uh, the floodplain uh, I question with Jordan Lake problems being what they are. Uh, we want more fertilizer uh, and flood conditions uh, going into that body of water. Um, so thank you very much. You're welcome. Is it anyone else that wants to speak on this item either for or against before I close the public hearing? I'll let the record reflect that no one else asked to speak, either for or against. I will declare the public hearing to be closed. Matters back before the council. Move the item. Recognize Councilman Shule. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wonder if uh, Mr. Jewell would like to respond to uh, John Kent's concerns. Yes, sir, on multiple levels. Uh, Dan Jewell again, Coulter Jewell Thames. Um, the, uh, the, the, the staff uh, and the application has been amended since the Planning Commission meeting. When we went to the Planning Commission originally, it was 
believed that we had to change the underlying future land use amendment for the, if you've seen the little finger of open space on the plan, uh, and uh, uh, that is now not the case. So uh, we are not actually requesting to change that open space designation. Uh, furthermore, um, I appreciate Mr. Kent's uh, concern about the stewardship of the uh, New Hope Creek it's itself. Um, some of you may know that, that my now passed away partner Ken Coulter is, was the author of the New Hope Creek uh, plan and that plan identified uh, bottomlands which were to remain preserved and as I stated on my testimony, uh, we are preserving those bottomlands. So thank you. Further questions? I recognize Councilman Shul. Um, Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to um, also uh, I, I had discussed this with Mr. Jewell today, but do you want to also talk about the characteristics of this 0.3 acres? Because I think that's important uh, in terms of thinking about this. I, I think the concerns that, that Mr. Kent are raising are very important, uh, but I think as many of our planning commissioners pointed out, I think that there's um, uh, you know, important differences between this and some other similar property that we might see. Um, and so if you could talk about that a little bit. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shule. Again, Dan Jewell. Uh, yes, um, the, uh, the, the preponderance of this, this little green sliver that goes into the property, uh, if you go out there and look at it, I actually have a photograph I could pass around if somebody wants to look at it, uh, is largely comprised of a 30-foot wide city sewer outfall easement that uh, the city maintains by mowing maybe once or twice a year. Uh, so, you know, it is not a, a pristine bottom woodland, um, it's, it's, it's a sewer easement and uh, that's, uh, that's why we think uh, that, that our, our request is appropriate in this case. Thank you. Uh, just one more comment, which is just to point out that John Kent, who is here tonight, was also here two weeks ago, stayed until the end of the meeting, 1230, and then bicycled home. Uh, and uh, John is a tremendous asset to our community uh, as an advocate for the New Hope Creek Corridor uh, and for all of our trails and open spaces. So I just wanted to commend him and thank him for being here. Thank you. Let me ask are there are other comments by members of the council. I recognize Councilman Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd, I'd like to ask Mr. Jewell if he would respond to the fertilizer issue that Mr. Hunt brought up. And, and the possible streaming of that fertilizer into the creek. Uh, that, that was a good question and an excellent point. Um, the, uh, the Witherspoons have been in this business, as, as they said, for, for 65 years. Uh, keep in mind that they are not, um, they're not farming in the conventional measure in that they are uh, planting plants in the ground and, and watering them and fertilizing them. Um, they actually uh, get rootstock, put it in pots, uh, and then they do very careful selective watering and fertilization of those pots just through the growing season and then they sell them. So uh, fertilizer uh, costs money and they only put out just that small amount directly into the potted plant, not onto the ground uh, that they need to ensure the health in the plants and so that when you buy them they're lush and green and ready to have flowers on them. So. Are there, are there further questions? Uh, well, Recognize uh, Councilman Davis. Yes, thank you. I, I don't know if Mr. Hunt, I mean, yeah, Mr. Kent, um, would like to respond to that or? Thank you. Um, I just, um, this is a significant natural heritage area that is, it's what's called the 15501 bottomlands. It, it's the floodplain, which is 1,300 feet wide, that um, starts at, um, the, the, under the designation 15501 bottomlands. It starts at 15501 and goes down to um, Old Chapel Hill Road. There, there are others, but this, this one is exceptional. And it's recognized as such by the North Carolina Natural Heritage Program. It's also a, a, an extremely important feature of our local natural environment. It's a link between two huge open space investments that the community has made one way or the other. The one 
owned by the Army Corps of Engineers are the game lands around Jordan Lake, and the other is owned by Duke University, the Duke Forest. And this area, since I believe when they built um, 15501, as you see it out there now, uh, two lanes of it back in 1956, um, the, 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 and then, uh, so you're connecting two towns with, with a new right-of-way. Um, and since then, I-40 has come. You're connecting two towns, and now you've got an interstate. The development pressure is on on this crucial link. And I get exercised every time I see a development that backs up to this floodplain, and we're not preserving the bottomland hardwood forest. By the way, that is our local special type of wetland, bottomland hardwood forest, that's us. Other places have marshes, et cetera, but this, this is a special place, and if we don't nick it, we're doing the right thing. Thank you. Recognize, offense, Councilman Davis. Recognize, it's Councilman Moffitt. Yeah, so, since we're now talking about the New Hope Creek Bottomlands Forest Natural Inventory Area, uh, I'll ask the applicant uh, about the relationship of the development and the bottomlands, the her natural heritage area. If you could just tell you us. You said you asked staff or you want him? Uh, no, I'm, I'm applicant. I'm sorry. That's all right. Sometimes I feel like staff, but I'm not. Thank you. Could you repeat the question again, Mr. Moffitt? Yes, the question that, that Mr. Kent raised was the relationship between the New Hope Creek Bottomlands Forest Natural Inventory Area mm -hmm. and the development. And one of the things that Mr. Kent said was, if you don't nick this area, we're doing the right thing. So can you tell us how this development relates to the um, natural heritage area? Uh, yes, sir. So, so we have gone to the state uh, resources that identifies where that uh, New Hope Creek bottomlands area is. It is uh, largely off the site, but there is a, a small little corner that is at the extreme southwest corner of the site that I believe is represented on the development plan as the building envelope, and uh, we have committed not to touch that area. Uh, you know, from a general standpoint, I think you could say all of Garrett Road community is, is within the watershed and within the bottomlands, but the, ident the area that's been identified specifically is that little corner that we're leaving alone. So you're, you will not be disturbing the natural heritage area at all? Not that area that we've, that we've identified, no, Great. sir. Thank yep. you. Is that it? Are there further questions? If not, entertain a motion on an item. Let me say this from the outset, we, and all of us have been going through some things. Uh, attorneys advise, uh, again, that we ought to make motions in the affirmative. So if the intent is to approve this uh, change, uh, the motion should be made in the affirmative, and you can vote against it if you want to. So entertain a motion on an item. Move the item. Second. To approve the recommendation changes. Is that the motion? Yes. Okay. It's been a problem moving second. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing and call the question. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? You close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. We now move to item 30, zoning map change. With the spoon, Garrett Rose, Z15000037. Good evening. I'm Grace Smith again with the Planning Department. This case, Witherspoon Garrett, Z15-00037, is a request to change the zoning designation of 4.58 acres located at 4800 Garrett Road on the west side of Garrett Road, midway between US 15501 and Chapel Hill Road, from office institutional to rural residential with a, de excuse me, a development plan. Construct, they are going to construct a northbound turn lane on Garrett Road and dedicate additional right-of-way for the frontage of the site along Garrett Road, uh, variable width along that uh, right-of-way. And as you just heard, they have committed on the development plan to stay out of the bottom land area. Staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan based on the action you just took to approve the plan amendment. And we're available if you have any additional questions. Thank you again. This is a public hearing on a zoning map change. You've heard the staff report. The public hearing is open. We'd ask first other questions by members of the... Council. If not, we recognize uh, 
Dan Jewell as a proponent. Let me ask, is anyone else who wants to speak as an op opponent of this zoning matter? If not, you have three minutes. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Dan Jewell again. No further testimony, just available to answer questions. Thank you. Again, is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item? Uh, let the record reflect that no one else in the public wanted to speak. I'll close the public hearing in the matter back before the council. Recognize Councilman Moffitt. Yes, I just wanted to comment that I share Mr. Kent's concern for environmental issues around New Hope Creek and indeed all of our waterways. Uh, given the Planning Commission's recommendations and the commitments to stay out of the natural heritage area and the condition of the site as it is today, I do support this um, application and be happy to make that motion at the appropriate time. Uh, appropriate time is now unless someone else has a comment. I'll, I'll move that we had, um, approve the application. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Hearing no questions, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Uh, it's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? And close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. We moved item 31, Unified Development Ordinance, Text Amendment, Technical Updates, Graphics TC 150 Thank you very much. Michael Stock with the Planning Department. Uh, text Amendment TC 150002 primarily provides new graphics or revisions to existing graphics or current standards within Unified Development Ordinance. Uh, minor technical text amendments are also proposed associated with uh, the proposed graphics. Uh, the following uh, amendments are proposed within the attached ordinance and dealed with, detailed within your uh, memo. Uh, new graphics for infill standards in section 6.8. Uh, new graphics for yard definitions in section 16.3, new graphic for fences and walls in section 9.9, .9. new graphics for bicycle parking standards in paragraph 1044, and again, uh, amendments for, uh, to text for technical corrections or clarifications related to those graphics. Uh, the JCC PC did review the proposed text amendment at its February 3rd meeting and provided no additional comments. Uh, the Bike Ped uh, Advisory Committee has al also reviewed the proposed uh, graphics and provided staff with comments which have been incorporated within the attached draft ordinance. The Planning Commission recommended approval 13-0 of the text amendment on April 12th and also included additional clarifying amendments which, which are detailed in the attached memo and have been incorporated into the attached draft ordinance. Um, as a reminder, City Council will be required to take two actions. The first action will be to vote on the ordinance uh, uh, amending the UDO found in attachment A and the second action will be the appropriate statement of consistency, attachment B, in your agenda packet. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. You've heard the staff report. It's a public hearing. The public hearing is open before we ask questions by members of the staff. Any questions? Recognize Councilman Shule. Mr. Mayor, I don't have a question, but I, I just wanted to thank Mr. Stock for this item and the next item uh, and the incredible detail, detailed work that it takes to do this. And I know you're often called upon to do these things, and uh, you do them extremely well, and they're very important, and I just wanted to express my appreciation. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Are there other comments by staff? Uh, this is a public hearing. Does anyone want to speak on this item, either for or against? Uh, let the record reflect that no one in the public asked to speak on this item. I will declare the public hearing to be closed. Matters back before council. Second. It's been properly moved and second to adopt. Yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. That's been proper move and second. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? And close the vote. It passes seven to zero. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Moved item 32, Unified Development Ordinance Text Amendment Technical Updates Due to State Legislation and Case Law, TC 15-0007. Thank you again, Michael Stock with the Planning Department. Text Amendment TC 15007 amends Unified Development Ordinance in response to statutory changes involving planning and environmental regulation passed by North Carolina General Assembly and signed into law by the governor during this past legislative session. In addition, North Carolina Supreme Court has recently held that uses not listed within the zoning ordinance or in Durham's case, a unified development ordinance, uh, cannot be prohibited because they are not listed within the ordinance. In consultation with the attorney's office, the attached ordinance, attach attachment A, proposes changes based upon the following legislation and that judicial decision with a discussion of each found within the attached memo. Uh, session law two th 
2015-1 uh, and to Section Law 2015-241. Uh, session Law 2015-86, Session Law 2015-149, Session Law 2015-160, Session Law 2015-246, and the Bird v. Franklin County case, which dealt with the use uh, regulations. Um, those have all been detailed within your memo. Uh, the JCCPC did review the proposed text amendment as February 3rd meeting uh, and provided no additional comments. The Planning Commission recommended approval 13-0. to 0 at its April 12th meeting. Um, and again, there are two actions to be taken. Uh, the first on the ordinance itself, and that's attachment A, and then the second action uh, for the appropriate statement of consistency, attachment B in your packet. And again, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you again. This is a public hearing. You've heard a staff report. I would ask some members of the council if you have questions. Hearing none, I would ask if anyone in the audience wants to speak on this item, either for or against the comments. Uh, let the record reflect that no one in the audience has to speak on this item. I declare the public hearing to be closed. Matters back before council. Mr. Mayor, I'll move that we adopt uh, the attached ordinance amending the Unified Development Ordinance. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Hearing no questions, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? You close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Thank you. Moved item 33, Unified Development Ordinance, Text Amendment, Reasonable Accommodation, TC 15-0006. Thank you again, Michael Stock with the Planning Department. Uh, TC 15-0006 is a text amendment that proposes revisions to Unified Development Ordinance to allow reasonable accommodations to the UDO requirements. Uh, these, develop, these regulations have been developed. Uh, developed regulations and a procedure to seek reasonable accommodations. Uh, just as background, uh, the Federal, Fousing, uh, Federal Fair Housing Amendment Act, or FHA of 1998, and the American with Disabilities Act prohibit discrimination against individuals with disabilities in housing and require local governments to be flexible in the application of land use, zoning, building regulations when accommodations may be necessary to afford uh, disabled persons an equal opportunity to housing. To better comply with the FHA and ADA requirements, staff is has proposed revisions to establish a formal procedure for persons with disabilities to seek reasonable accommodations to UDO requirements and establish criteria to be used when considering such requests. Staff, upon review of similar ordinances of other jurisdictions, proposed uh, to establish reasonable accommodation process that would require quasi-judicial hearing and approval by the Board of Adjustment. The proposal also includes revisions to UDO definition of family with regard to reasonable accommodation and the requirements of the FHA. The uh, Joint City County Planning Committee, JCCPC, uh, did review uh, this proposed text amendment on February 3rd and provided no additional comments. They did recommend uh, sending it on to the Human Relations Commission and the Mayor's Committee for Persons with Disabilities. No comments. Uh, the comments that were received from these two entities were incorporated into these regulations. Uh, the Planning Commission recommended approval 12 to 1 of the text amendment at their April 12th meeting. And the recommendation also included some additional clarifying amendments. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Again, this is a public hearing. You heard the staff report. Would ask other questions by members of the council? Are there questions by members of the audience? Yeah. Recognize Ms. Peterson. If you go to the podium, you have two minutes, Ms. Peterson. Over the last, uh, I, I'm Mrs. Peterson. I'm one of the political activists here in Durham. Over the last several years, I have uh, <clears throat> I've been having some serious issues with my vision. I've come to the city council several times, as, as well as uh, I think another young lady also. She's not here, so I'm not going to mention her name. Even to this day, we have asked for equipment, the kind of equipment that the city council is using right now to be able to see. We've asked for some other additional information. To this day, we have not received that. And I don't know what's going on. I, I don't understand why the city says, says one thing to the public, what I feel, given the public, the perception that they really are working with everyone, which I think some of us who, who do have disabilities, that is not happening. Uh, even uh, the resolution that, uh, that uh, that Ms. McFadden read. It is so small there in the book, it's very hard and very hard and very difficult to even read. 
the city really need, there are some programs out that the city can bring on board to help persons who have visual problems as well as hearing problems and even some persons who have difficulties in reading, persons who are dyslexic or, or persons who are, um, I think, ADA, who may have some slow reading. There are some programs and some applications that you can bring here in this facility to use for the public when we come in. So. I hear what you're saying, but I think some of us have some real serious problems. Mr. Bonfield, I know you know I've spoken to you on several occasions and you have spoken to me, but still there is no computer, there is nothing down there on that floor that the disability person can come in and go over and look at the materials. Even this viewing up here, you should also have something down there on the floor that we can see. I actually have to come all the way over here to look at it, where the city council members have something right there at your desk, right, Mr. Davis? Okay, so if, they, if you can put it up there, why can't you put it down here uh, for the public, for we who do have various disabilities? And thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. So you don't see That information, right, on there. Okay, oh, okay, so that is not on there? Well, that should be on there also. If they, could put, if they could put it up there, they can also put it on here too. Somebody, you really need, and I just want to say this, Mr. Mayor, and I'll sit down. You really need to hire a person who has knowledge of the various equipment out here to work with persons who have various disabilities. Somebody needs to come on staff that are sort of certified really in that area. And thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. I'm going to recognize the city manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ms. Peterson, members of the council, uh, assuming that the uh, budget is adopted later this evening, uh, one of the initiatives in the budget is to uh, modify our technology to allow live streaming of the city council meeting on mobile devices. Staff has already been working on uh, uh, being prepared uh, once that is up and running to uh, have devices that would be available for the uh, visually impaired uh, to be able to utilize at both uh, city council meetings and work sessions. Okay, let me ask if there are other questions, comments, any other comments on this? If not, let the record reflect that no one else asked to speak, taking into consideration Ms. Peterson's comments as part of the public record. I declare the public hand to be closed and that before the council. Mr. Mr. Mayor, once again, I'll move that we ad adopt the attached uh, ordinance amending the Unified Development Ordinance. It's been properly moved and second. Further questions here and on? Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passed the seven to zero. Thank you. We move to item 34, consolidated annexation, estates at Fendel Farm, BDG 15008Z15003. 3A. Thank you. Thank you. Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Apartments. Um, this case is a request for a utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation, and initial zoning. Um, applications for two contiguous par parcels located along Dock Nichols Road. Um, these two parcels comprise 116 acres. Um, the site is presently zoned residential rural and is located in the Falls Jordan B Watershed Protection Overlay District. Um, this contiguous annexation represents an extension of the existing city limit. Um, the subject site is presently vacant and if the request is approved, the applicant intends to construct a 200 unit residential development at the subject site. Um, the site plan for this project um, is included in your packet as attachment H and is currently under review. Um, the applicant has requested an exact translation of the RRFJB zoning district, um, which is the least intense zoning district uh, based on the development here and the size of these lots. Uh, Public Works and Water Management performed a utility impact analysis for the utility extension agreement and have determined that there is existing service uh, to serve this subject site. And budget and management services performed a fiscal analysis, which indicated that the proposal will most likely be revenue positive immediately upon annexation. 
um, and staff recommends that the council approve the utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation, and initial zoning. You've heard the staff report the, the public hearing. The matter is open for comments first from the members of the council. Questions? If not, we have one person that is signed to speak for this item, Gerard Heaton. Is anyone else who wants to speak either for or against this proposed change? If not, you have three minutes. Good evening. Uh, Jared Edens with Edens Land Corp. I'll be very brief. Um, we do have a site plan and review. Uh, as council may recall, it was about a year ago that the uh, Lick Creek Regional Pump Station funding for that was approved and a sewer basin fee was put in place for this entire sewer basin. Um, for that reason, I think it's just these types of projects, knowing that what development is on the way, that we should be looking at annex because that's how we recoup some of those sewer fees to the city. Uh, the fee is about $4,300 per unit. So on a 200 unit project, you're looking at about an $860,000 reimbursement that goes to the city when the construction drawings for this site are approved. That's in my calculations about 5% of the total cost of the Lick Creek station that's currently under design. So I think this is a good thing for the city and I'd be glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Other questions by members of the council, of the developer? If not, is there anyone else who wants to speak on this item? Uh, the director reflect that no one else asked to speak. I'll declare the public hearing to be closed. Matters back before the council. Recognize Councilman Shul. Uh, do all this in, in a single motion, is that correct, planning staffers? Yes. Uh, I will move the uh, utility extension agreement, the, plan the uh, annexation ordinance, and the initial zoning ordinance. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Hearing no questions, call the question. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. That's the seven is zero. Thank you. Move to item 35, cons uh, the consistency, consistency statement. statement. I move to adopt the consistency statement. Second. Been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes the seven is zero. Item 35, consolidated annexation, T.W. Alexander at North Carolina 55, BDG 15.00015, A15.00013, Z15.00032. Thank you, Jacob Wiggins again with the planning department. Um, this request is for T.W. Uh, multifamily. It's a request for utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation, comprehensive plan amendment, and zoning map change for the T.W. Alexander at NC55 project. Um, the subject site is comprised of three parcels located at the northeast quadrant of T.W. Alexander at NC55. Um, the applicant requests to change the existing county zoning designation of commercial neighborhood and residential rural to residential suburban multifamily with a development plan. Um, additionally, the applicant requests to change the medium density residential and industrial future land use map designations to medium high density residential. Uh, the development plan associated with this request commits to the following 192 to 300 multifamily dwelling units, three vehicular access points, roadway improvements, tree preservation, uh, a buffer along the northern boundary, as well as stream buffers. Um, text commitments include a commitment for multifamily housing type, dedication of right of way, side access improvements, and four additional uh, feet of asphalt for a bicycle lane. Uh, Public Works and Water Management uh, performed the utility impact analysis and um, have determined that the existing city of Durham water main has the capacity for the developments um, off-site. Water main extensions will be required and the site will be served by the Durham County sewer system. Uh, budget Management Services performed the fiscal impact analysis which determined that the proposed annexation will be revenue positive immediately upon annexation. Um, Staff recommends that should the comprehensive plan amendment be approved, this request would be consistent with the comprehensive plan and other adopted policies and ordinances. And the planning commission recommended approval by a vote of 11 to two on this item on April 12th, 2016. Again, this is a public hearing. You've heard the staff report. Are there questions, comments? Uh, I have one person that signed up to speak on this item, proponent, Jared. Eatons, is anyone else who wants to speak on this item? 
Tonight you have three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Jared Edens with Edens Land Corp. I'm here representing my client, Hopper Communities. I uh, appreciate Jacob's summary of our request. I'm just going to highlight a few brief points and um, be on my way. Um, just to point out a few items, we are asking for rezoning for 192 to 300 units. Uh, that could be a combination of townhomes and or apartments. Uh, we did perform a traffic study as part of the request. Uh, the traffic study was approved by both NCDOT and the city of Durham. Um, both Highway 55 and TW Alexander, as you see in the staff report, have ample capacity for additional development at this location. We're actually reducing the number of trips per the staff report from the current zoning on the property with the rezoning. Uh, we did have a neighborhood meeting last year in July. Uh, we had two people in attendance. We have no opposition that I'm aware of. Uh, as Jacob mentioned, Planning Commission gave us approval a couple months ago by vote of 11-2. I also want to point out, uh, as with many residential uh, rezonings in Durham, uh, many of my clients uh, will offer up a, a fee to the school system in exchange for the additional students that will result from the rezoning. I believe in this case we have 33 additional students from the rezoning. Uh, my client's willing to offer up $500 per student. Uh, which I believe is $16,500. That check would be cut to Durham County Schools prior to the first final plat for the development. Uh, again, I'll be glad to any, answer any questions you have. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there questions by the developer? I recognize Councilman Shule and the Mayor Pro Tem. Mayor Crosby says, okay. mm -hmm. uh, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the um, Thank you for the proffer uh, concerning the Durham Public School students. I was going to ask about that. I appreciate it. The, um, my concern is, uh, and, and you and I have discussed this, is the sidewalk um, along NC-55 and T.W. Alexander. Um, and I have, uh, I, I know that, I think that m my understanding of uh, what our rules are is somewhat different than yours in terms of the payment in lieu opportunities. Um, uh, and so uh, I, my concern is that I, I think we ought to, what I would like you all to do is to proffer to build a sidewalk um, because um, it's needed out there very much. And um, our, the way our site plan, the way our ordinance reads now, uh, having to do with some legislative changes, you can no longer just have part of the uh, sidewalk be built and then part paid in lieu. At least that's my understanding from the planning staff, and we should probably check in with them. Uh, so I know that that was something that you had been thinking about, if there was a difficult part to do the payment in lieu, as we discussed today. Uh, but uh, I really uh, would uh, be interested to see if you were interested in proffering the construction of that sidewalk rather than the payment in lieu. And I uh, also might like to hear perhaps first from the planning staff on the status of, of what the actual rule is on that. Uh, yes, sir. Jacob Williams with Planning Department. So it is possible to build a portion of the sidewalk and pay a payment in lieu of for the remaining portion of the sidewalk. It is. Yes, sir. Okay. So I got a, a different opinion uh, today. Um, you want to talk to me about it, Mr. Medlin? <laughs> Good evening, Steve Medlin with the Durham City County Planning Department. The QDO basically prescribes that a developer has the right to either do payment in lieu or build the sidewalk. It even goes so far, far as to say, I'm sorry from High Point, um, that, uh, that uh, uh, you cannot mix and match. You have to pick one and, and do that per each frontage type or frontage. So uh, in this case, there are two frontages. They could pick to do payment in lieu for one and build sidewalk for the other. But for that whole furniture, it has to be one or the other. So, I think that's different than at least the understanding you expressed to me today. Uh, and given that, I was uh, hopeful that you would be willing to proffer the construction of the sidewalk rather than the payment in lieu. Yes, sir. Thank you. And my, my only concern was is, is there's about 2,500 feet of road frontage, and at site plan, we're going to be required to show site plan uh, sidewalk along the frontage and be required to build it. And I've been working in Durham 18 years now. Maybe I've had one case where a payment in lieu was actually approved by the engineering department because we have to show 
that we actually can't construct the portion of sidewalk we're looking for. So the only reason I was hesitant before was I didn't want to be able to build 2,490 feet of sidewalk, have 10 feet that I couldn't build, and because of this zoning condition, have to go back and rezone the site again over, that, over those 10 feet. Um, that being said, if that's proffer is needed to move this item forward, then we can make that proffer tonight and just hope that we have no issues during construction. Does that mean you are proffering that? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. I recognize Mayor Pro Tem. Mr. Edens, um, how many units are you building out there? Okay. So we're, we're zoning for a range of between 192 to 300 units. So 192 units would be more of a townhome project at about eight units an acre, mm -hmm. uh, but the range goes up to 300 units, which would be apartments at about 12 units an acre. Are any of them affordable? Of course we cannot. I have I had no discussions with my clients about affordable housing at this site, no. Really? I have okay. not. Okay, that's, okay. Thank you. Are, are there other questions of the developer? Mr. Staff has a comment? Um, could we please just get Mr. Edens to confirm on the record that he uh, voluntarily proffered the $500 payment for per student? Yes. Thank you. Any other comments, questions about council? Does anyone in the audience wants to speak on this item? Uh, let the record reflect that no one in the audience has to speak on this item. <coughs> I declare the public hearing to be closed. Matters back before council. Mr. Mayor, I will move the, um, I believe I need to move the annexation, the uh, land use map designation, and the rezoning, and I do so. And property move and second. Is the utility extension a part of that? And the utilities extension. Thank you. Okay. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Will you close the vote? It passes seven and zero. Consistency statement. It's been prompted and moved and second. Madam Clerk, we open the vote. Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Moved to item 36, consolidated annexation, Crescent Drive slash Farrington Road, BDG 15-0016-Z, 16-0010-A. Thank you. Uh, Jacob Wiggins again with the Planning Department. Um, this is a request to annex a portion of Crescent Drive. Um, this is a 2.36 acre portion of Crescent Drive. Um, it's contiguous to the existing city limits. Um, it is adjacent to the recently approved Farrington mixed use rezoning case. Um, if approved, um, the applicant for that rezoning case has indicated that they intend to develop this portion of Crescent Drive um, to public street standards. Um, the applicant has requested an initial zoning designation of residential suburban 20, major transportation corridor overlay, and Falls Jordan B, which is consistent with applicable policies. Um, an extension agreement was not required as no utilities will be installed as part of this project. Um, additionally, budget management services did not perform a fiscal impact analysis as the request only involves right of way. Um, staff recommends that the council approve the voluntary annexation and initial zoning for this item. Again, this is a public hearing. You've heard the staff report and ask other questions by members of the council. If not, is there anyone in the audience that wants to speak on this item. I really didn't see anyone that signed up to speak on this item, item 36. Uh, let the record reflect that no one asked to speak on this item. Uh, I'll declare the public hearing to be closed. Matters back before the council. Mr. Mayor, I'll move that we adopt the annexation site and the building It's been properly moved and second. For the discussion here and uncalled question, Madam Clerk, we open the vote. Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. It's been properly moved and second, Madam Clerk, we open the vote. Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Move to item thirty seven, consolidated annexation, Herndon Road, BDG fifteen zero 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 seventeen, Z sixteen zero 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 eleven A. Thank you, Jacob Wiggins with the planning department. Um, 
This is a request for utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation, and initial zoning for three contiguous parcels located at the northwest quadrant of Herndon Road at Massey's Chapel Road. Uh, these parcels comprise 2.633 acres, including the adjacent right-of-way. Um, this annexation represents an extension of the existing city limits. The subject site is presently vacant, and if this request is approved, the applicant intends to construct four single-family homes at the subject site. Um, the applicant has requested an exact translation of the residential suburban 10 Falls Jordan B zoning designation for these parcels. Budget and Management Services performed a fiscal impact analysis, which indicates that the request is likely to be revenue positive immediately upon completion, and Public Works and Water, water Management performed the utility impact analysis and utility extension agreement and determined that the City of Durham water and sanitary sewer lines have capacity to serve the existing, or excuse me, the proposed development. Staff recommends that the council approve the utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation, and initial zoning request. This is a public hearing. Uh, you've heard a staff report of it. Questions by members of the council. I have one person to sign up to speak on this item. Gerard Eatons, is anyone else that wants to speak? Thank you, you have three minutes. Jared Eden's Eden's Land Corp. Um, I believe this is fairly straightforward. I'm just here to answer any questions that may come up. Thank you. Does, does your uh, development know there's supposed to be a traffic circle down in that area? Yes, sir. We've gotten the plans from NCDOT and have shared that with my client. Thank you. Any further questions by counsel? Does anyone in the audience wants to speak on this item? Uh, let the record reflect, reflect that no one else has to speak. I would credit public hearing to be closed. Matters by report council. Entertain a motion on item. Move the, move the item. Consolidate it. Annexation be removed. Second. You also got the utility extension agreement. Okay, utility extension extension agreement and annexation order. Annexation. Second all that? Who second? Okay, it's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. Passes seven and zero. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven and zero. Moved item 38, ordinance to change city county planning department fees. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council, Pat Young with Planning Department. Uh, as required by law, this is a public hearing associated with proposed change to the Planning Department fees for FY17. Uh, technically, it's a change to Chapter 6 of the fee schedule for the city. Um, we have conducted, as required by law, um, advertising, public notice, and we also conducted supplemental outreach to stakeholders and received positive feedback as these fee changes are directly aligned with uh, improved proposed improvements to service and, and establishment of the Development Services Center. I'll be happy to ta ha take any questions you have on this item. Thank you. Again, it's a public hearing. You've heard a staff report or the questions by the council staff report. It's a public hearing on water and sewer fees. Uh, are there any, is anyone in the audience who wants to speak on this item? Uh, let the record reflect that no one in the audience has to speak. I'll declare the public hearing to be closed. Matters back before the council entertain a motion on the item. I'll move that we adopt the uh, fees as requested. Second. I said water and sewer fees. I didn't mean to say that. It's been, <laughs> <laughs> it's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. Thank Pass you. Pass the seven to zero. Move to item 47, street closing, Wilkinson Avenue, street closing, 16000004. Good evening, Kyle Taylor with the Planning Department. This request is to permanently close 414.35 linear feet of Wilkerson Avenue. The right-of-way is currently open, and the portion of the street requested to close is bordered by property under single ownership by Wexford Chesterfield Parking, LLC. If this request is approved, the, the adjacent parcels and right-of-way will be combined into, single, into a single part, parcel as shown in attachment four. 
and a parking deck will be constructed at the subject site. A site plan is indicated, is uh, attached for your, uh, in your staff report. Staff determines um, that staff has no issue with this proposal and recommends the closure of this ratify. Thank you very much. Again, it's a public hearing. It's prepared to staff report on the street closing. I'm going to ask other questions by members of the council. Anyone in the audience that wants to speak on this item, this item been a public hearing. Uh, again, I'd like to rec reflect that no one in the audience has to speak on this item. I'll declare the public hearing to be closed. I'm asking for council to take a motion on the item. Mr. Mayor, I'll move to adopt the order. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Any questions? Hearing none. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? You close the vote? It passes 7 to 0. Thank you. Okay. We're here for uh, item 53, supplemental item, zoning map change, Cornwallis Road property, Z1500031. And before we get into this, I'm going to ask the city attorney if he will make some comments relative to this item, mainly procedural issues. I recognize the city attorney. Mr. Patrick Mayor, Bay. members of council, um, at about around 3.30 to 4 o'clock today, I sent you all an email with a memo regarding uh, the procedural issues uh, related to this uh, item. Um, if you have specific questions, I, I tried to make it as straightforward as I could so even I could understand it, and, and I think after a while I was able to understand it. Um, but what you have in front of you right now is, is both a... Um, a, the, the zoning map change, the rezoning request, um, and a, a motion, uh, uh, if it, it is so made, a, a motion uh, to renew a previous motion. Um, and I've given you some information about the, um, the, the, uh, uh, the propriety of, of having uh, that motion and some of the concerns that have been raised uh, and tried to identify for you the, um, the issues in your procedures that, that may make that motion to renew uh, inappropriate at this time, uh, depending on how you look at it. Um, regardless, you, you will need to have the, the zoning map change. Um, uh, since it's in front of you, it has to be disposed uh, one way or the other. Uh, and then there's an issue that, that either myself or planning staff can speak to you about regarding a, a, a zoning map change that's inconsistent with the, the comprehensive uh, plan. Uh, and that depends on how you, you interpret um, the suggestions that I provided in this memo. Happy to answer any questions as you go forward. Otherwise, I, I think the, um, the zoning map um, uh, item can, can continue. Well, for, for the purpose of not only the council, but for the audience, particularly those persons who are potentially impacted by this, uh, this is a zoning hearing, but you've also spoke about a change in the can you speak to that in terms of what we can and can't do, how it affects the zoning piece? Sure, and, and I may have my dates um, uh, incorrect here, but back in April, uh, you, you, the item, uh, there were two items that appeared related to uh, the Cornwallis Road property, uh, too. One was the comprehensive uh, uh, plan amendment um, uh, that was in front of you and also uh, the zoning map change. Uh, the way that this is set up, uh, the, the zoning map change can't occur without the, the comprehensive plan um, uh, amended um, because of the UDO provision that provides that uh, any rezonings must be consistent with the comprehensive plan. That's why the comprehensive plan was uh, before the zoning map change because if the plan's not not amended, then the uh, the zoning wouldn't be um, uh, compatible with the the comprehensive plan. Um, in April, you um, <laughs> you voted down, and, and that, that's where, where it gets a little 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 funky. Um, but you you essentially uh, uh, voted to not approve the comprehensive plan amendment. Um, in which case, although it doesn't necessarily moot the zoning map change um, based on your UDO. Uh, the recommendation from the, the administration and the legal department would be to deny the zoning map change because it wouldn't be consistent with the comprehensive uh, plan. The issue that we have in front of you is that um, there is a, a, a portion of your, your uh, council rules of procedures that allow you to make a motion to renew, and that would be a, a motion that is held at a separate meeting uh, from, uh, to, to uh, essentially um, I don't want to use the word reconsider, so I have to come up with another word because that's a whole different legal legal issue. But basically, uh, you could revive a motion that you previously decided on, um, and it would be a two-step motion similar to your 
your, your motion to suspend, suspend the rules where you'd make a motion to renew, and if uh, that got a second and was voted uh, affirmatively, uh, then the motion that you had voted on in a previous meeting would be back in front of you, just the motion, uh, not the public hearing. Um, but the issue here, and I've raised this in the, uh, in the memo, is that the way, in, and I'll take some responsibility in eight years, I've consistently told you to not make motions in the negative, but to make them in the affirmative. Um, as I recall, at the end of that particular uh, hearing, there was some, some challenge in terms of making sure that everybody understood what motions were being made, uh, and a motion was made in the negative. The motion was made to deny uh, the, um, the, the, um, the comprehensive uh, plan amendment, um, and that motion actually passed. Where it becomes a challenge for, for you procedurally is that a motion to renew uh, specifically requires a motion to have been defeated. So the question then becomes, was any motion actually defeated? The motion that was in front of you and the administration presents all motions in the affirmative, um, had you voted that motion down, then that would have been the motion that was defeated. But uh, instead, the motion that was made was a motion to deny, uh, which was actually passed. Um, it's hyper-technical, but it's probably the reason why it's been our consistent recommendation that you don't make motions in the negative um, and the one it's also time the I, reason we have lawyers yeah <laughs> and and the one time I, I allowed you to do it 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 uh it has created a, a, a bit of an issue for you okay so where, where we are the fact is that the comprehensive plan amendment was not adopted for this particular item uh, and if we've been consistent with the UDO it means that if you're going to approve a zoning, it has to be in conjunction with the comprehensive plan amendment. So what it means is that we can go through the zoning hearing, which is on the agenda, uh, unless someone does something different, we can go through the zoning hearing, but the result of it is that we will still have to deny the rezoning because the comprehensive plan has not been changed. Now, if someone wants to make a motion, as the attorney has indicated, to deal with the comprehensive plan, that's a different issue. So right now, I need to understand where the council is. If there are any motions coming forth on the comprehensive plan amendment, I need to hear them. If not, then we're going to move forward with the zoning uh, hearing. So I don't hear any. So therefore, we're going to move forward with the zoning hearing. But uh, I, I, I'm telling you, it's almost foregone what, what the results are going to be. That is, we can't approve the zoning hearing on our UDO. Can the staff come forward? Good evening, Grace Smith with the Planning Department again. I'm here to introduce the Cornwallis Road Residential 2 case, Z15-00031. This case is to rezone 40.95 acres located at 2417 West Cornwallis Road, south side of West Cornwallis Road between Welcome Drive and US 15501, from residential suburban 20 to commercial general to plan and to planned de development residential 3.672 to allow for 122 single family residential units. This uh, hearing was continued on April 4th and again on June 6th to the, this hearing tonight. The development plan commits to the following, 122 single family residential units, two vehicular access points, a maximum of 70% impervious surface, 20% tree preservation, and a maximum of 19 single family lots adjacent to the existing, excuse me, existing colony park neighborhood. Uh, text commitments also include a commitment for single family housing types, a buffer along the western boundary, affordable housing, dedication of right of way, and site access improvements, and a street right, uh, elimination of a private street, street right of way along Granville Court, two greenway easements through the site, and a pedestrian access easement from Tanglewood Drive. Staff determines that this request is not consistent with the comprehensive plan. As uh, city attorney stated, the plan amendment was not approved at your April 4th meeting. Staff is available if you have any questions. Okay, this is a public hearing. The public hearing is open on rezoning. I would ask first, are there questions by members of the council of the staff report? If not, we have five persons that have signed up to speak. Uh, two as, three as proponents and two as opponents. Uh, I'm going to call the names and just make sure that everyone that wants to speak uh, knows they have a right to speak on this. I have Jared Edens as a proponent, Patrick Biker as a proponent, and Lyle Overcash as a proponent. Are there any other proponents of this proposed rezoning matter? 
I have two persons that have signed up to speak as opponents, uh, Jim Connor and Kathy Baratine. Now, is there anyone else that wants to speak in opposition to this proposed rezoning matter? Uh, that being the case, uh, we're going to allow 15 minutes for the proponents and 15 minutes for the opponents. Uh, I recognize, which one do you want me? Patrick, who's, who's going to speak first? I uh, recognize Patrick Biker. Good evening, Mayor Bell, Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden, members of the City Council. My name is Patrick Biker. I live at 2614 Stewart Drive. I'm an attorney in Durham with Morningstar Law Group, along with my colleague Neil Ghosh. I'm here tonight representing Pulte Homes for this zoning map change. With us tonight are our traffic engineer, Lyle Overcash, with VHB, our site engineer, Jared Edens, with Edens Land Corp., Bob Anderson and Randy King from Pulte, and our real estate advisor, Jim Stewart, from Stewart, Martin, and McCoy. At the outset, we wish to highlight that we are only asking for 3.672 units per acre in the case before you tonight, which represents a good transition from the two units per acre in Colony Park to the over five units per acre with the townhouses that are directly adjacent to the south. Moreover, in order to provide a smoother transition, we have committed to providing a maximum of 19 lots on the western edge of the property. Due to existing floodplain, this commitment will result in 19 new homes backing up to nine existing homes, or put another way, there will be 2.11 new homes for every existing home. It is also important to note that we have designated this property to be developed only with single-family detached homes. In keeping with current market trends and sound planning principles, these homes will be on relatively small lots. This is simply good stewardship of the land. At one point in time, after World War II, Durham could develop houses with half-acre or larger lots, in part to accommodate septic tanks. Now, in 2016, that is unwise. Durham is a small county with fewer than 300 square miles, and most of the developable land is developed. Durham has to be a good steward of its limited land, and the proposal before you this evening does just that. In addition, it is vital for the City of Durham to consider the needs of new residents who are moving here. As you can see from this slide, from 2010 to 2014, our city added more than 23,000 new people. That works out to approximately 5,900 more people each year, with about one-third being children born here and about two-thirds being people who moved here. Doing the math, we find that approximately 75 people per week are moving into the city of Durham. That's at least 10 new people every day. It has been my privilege to appear before the city council on many occasions to discuss development. And on the residential side, my recollection is that it has been primarily for apartments that are for rent. My strong belief is that not all 10 people who will move here tomorrow will want to be in an, in an apartment. Some will want to be in a single family detached home. This proposal tonight meets the demands of people who are moving here so they can live and work in Durham, rather than work in Durham and live somewhere else, which is all too common. Moreover, this location is very conveniently located to major employment. It is a very short commute from this site to Duke University Medical Center, our region's largest employer. It is also a very short commute from this location to South Square and employment centers such as Blue Cross Blue Shield. As I believe I have mentioned before to the City Council, according to Forbes.com, the Triangle Region has the unfortunate distinction of generating more vehicle miles traveled per household than any other metro region in our country. In the Triangle, quote, the average household racks up 21,800 miles per year, unquote. Now that is not sustainable. We need to do more to encourage shorter commutes, and this type of infill, contiguous residential development is the way to do that. Additionally, the proposal before you tonight will allow for a more complete greenway system. Without the blue portion of the trail shown on this slide, which is a committed element of this proposal, a connection from the existing green portion to the trails at Duke University is nearly impossible. We also want to state on the record that this development plan will not provide vehicular access from this site across the floodplain to Tanglewood Drive, which is only a paper street. Next, in regard to traffic, it is not often that I present to Council a development that is expected to decrease traffic, as is the case here. Though no traffic study was required of this project, Pulte had VHB perform one, as they wanted to verify the safety of their proposed design. As shown in the staff report, the current traffic volume on Cornwallis Road is only 4,800 cars per day, which is about one-third of its capacity. 
In connection with this project, Pulte will install turn lane and bike lane improvements on Cornwallis, which should improve traffic safety at this location. Again, I would point out that the proposed zoning would actually decrease traffic from what would be expected under the current zoning. Now I want to touch on the buffer along Colony Park. These are four lots on Tryon Road, each about 120 feet wide. As you can see, these houses are set back about 80 feet from the rear property line. We are proffering a 50 foot wide buffer and this new buffer, and this is the new buffer area. That buffer will have 0.6 opacity, which consists of seven evergreen trees, 16 evergreen understory trees, and 68 shrubs every 100 feet. That equates to one evergreen tree about every 14 feet, one evergreen understory tree every six feet, and one shrub about every 18 inches. All of this landscaping must be installed before Pulte can start vertical construction on any of the 19 houses adjacent to this 50-foot buffer. In addition, we have committed to providing a 20-foot wide planted streetscape buffer along Cornwallis. This buffer will have 40% opacity, which equates to three canopy trees, one evergreen tree, seven understory trees, and 40 shrubs every 100 feet. This will enhance the aesthetic quality of Cornwallis Road for drivers and bicyclists. In summary then, as shown on this slide, there are many benefits that accrue to the City of Durham from this proposed development plan. I'd like to mention just one last point. This proposal before the City Council tonight is, to my knowledge, the first development to include affordable home ownership. As is stated in the staff report, five new homes will be sold to persons who are at 60% of our area median income. It is my belief we need to support home ownership because we lag slightly behind the other top cities in North Carolina. Durham is just under 50% in regard to home ownership, and I would like to see us do better. From the presentations the council received on affordable housing on March 10 and June 2nd, it is clear that we have work to do. This proposal before the council tonight will achieve 10% of the draft home ownership goal stated in the March 10 presentation and will do so at 60% AMI rather than the stated 80%. In my opinion, only with a national builder like Pulte that can self-finance is this committed element in support of home ownership feasible. My perception is that affordable housing was one of the top issues in the recent city council election, and here's the opportunity to turn vision into reality. And so for all these reasons, we respectfully ask for the council's approval of this zoning map change if the council is willing to support this zoning map change, we respectfully request your approval of the comprehensive plan amendment to designate this assemblage for zero to four units per acre, which is low density residential. We wish to reserve the balance of our time for rebuttal, and then our team will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, let me ask first are there questions by the developer at this time, my members of the council. Uh, in that case, we we'll move to the opponents, uh, Jim Connor and Kathy Barrington. And you have 15 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm Jim Connor, uh, resident at 1804 Round Rock Boulevard in Durham, a member of the law firm Calhoun Bell and Seacrest. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council, I'm here representing Colony Park neighborhood. I'd ask the folks who are here from Colony Park to stand up, please. Members of the council, you know, excuse me, members of the council, you know how many times they've been here uh, on this matter. We appreciate your attention as many times as you've had to give to it. But these folks are serious about this. These folks have put in hundreds of hours of volunteer labor researching this, bringing scientists to you. You're going to hear from Kathy Baratan after I finish, um, bringing uh, Kurt Richardson to you, an, an internationally known wetland scientist who doesn't live in the neighborhood, who was not paid, was simply asked to give his opinion, his honest opinion, and he gave it to you. You heard it, and you may have read and had an opportunity or not to read the letter he sent you this afternoon that went into more detail. These folks who are scientists, who are experts, who are not residents of the community, who are unpaid, are here to tell you that a bad mistake would be made if Pulte's rezoning was granted. And they're here to tell you that out of their, out of their scientific expertise. I 
I want to set a little context here. Um, Paul, to you, and you know this. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but I think it's good to get our heads in the right space, if you will. Pardon that colloquial expression. Um, Pulte is asking you for a special favor. This property is already zoned. It's been zoned. That's the law. This property can be developed under its current zoning. It's zoned for productive uses. It's zoned for part of its commercial over by the big highway, and the rest of it's zoned to residents per acre, just like Colony Park is. So that exists. There's no need for you to do something that will allow this land to be productive. They're asking for a rezoning despite the eloquence of their representative. Patrick always does a great job. But despite the eloquence of their representative, Pulte Corporation is here asking for this for one reason. That's so they can make more money. That's OK. They're a corporation. They're allowed to make money. That's what it's about, though, from that side. Make no mistake about that. I've read their, their annual reports. I've read what it says. I look for the things you look for from good companies, good corporate citizens, where they talk about their environmental protection projects, their uh, giving back to the community. Pulte Group Incorporated doesn't even bother to say that. They talk about how they're leveraging their assets, how they're increasing their profits, and so forth. That's the company we're talking about. That's who wants to do this. Please don't let your familiarity with or your uh, regard for their representative um, make you think otherwise. Now, I want to get into some of these technical details, and I'm sorry to do it, but they're, they, there they are. Um, there we go. So this is what, we, what we've been talking about uh, from the UDO. This is an ordinance. This is not advisory. This is the law. It says, all petitions for zoning map change shall be consistent with the comprehensive plan. A petition for zoning map change shall not be approved by the governing body when there is a conflict with the comprehensive plan as determined by the planning director or designee. So governing body shall not approve. It's not an optional thing. That has been determined by you at your April 4th meeting where you voted down, excuse me, you voted in favor of the motion to turn down this, the uh, comprehensive plan amendment. So that, we believe, settles the issue. I'm here to talk to you about all the other things because Mr. Biker did, and you may want to hear them, but uh, uh, that, I think, settles the issue. I want to talk very briefly about, I don't have a slide on it, but I want to talk very briefly about this renewal of the motion from April 4th. As you know, if you read Mr. Baker's memo, and I have it here in my hand, um, a motion that, that is defeated may be renewed at any later date, excuse me, any later meeting. There was no motion defeated, as Mr. Baker has referred to. So I do not believe that it is proper for this council to renew the motion at this point because this does not apply. And yes, that is hyper-technical, but the effort to bring it forward as a renewal is hyper-technical. You've already made your vote. You voted six to one against it. And to bring it back up as a technical thing, technically you can't do it because it was defeated. Uh, excuse me, because nothing was defeated, because it was passed. All right. Um, moving along. <clears throat> so there is the, let's say, Spinning it forwards, let's say that someone on council does make an effort, to, uh, a motion to renew, someone seconds it, you vote in favor of renewing it, and then you pass the plan amendment. Does that mean you can then pass the rezoning? And I want to say to you that still means you cannot pass the rezoning. You still cannot. And here's the staff planning report. You've all got it in your package. That part that was circled at the bottom on the front page says, this request is not consistent with the connectivity standards of UDO section 12.3.1 F3, nor comprehensive plan policy 8.1.6 F and the future land use map. Now, if you approve the comprehensive plan change, you'll be fixing one of those three things, the last one, the future land use map. You will not be fixing comprehensive plan policy 816 F. What is that? That is external co connectivity. I've got a copy of picture, picture of that on your screens. Uh, the determination, again, back to the staff planning report, was uh, that the uh, requested zoning district is not consistent with the future land use map, nor policy 8.6.1F, external connectivity of the comprehensive plan. And it goes on to give you more details. So there's yet another reason that under your laws, 
that require it to be consistent with the comprehensive plan before you can pass a rezoning that you cannot do it. Now, I hate talking about technicalities because nobody likes them. What I want to talk to you about now in a few minutes I've got left is the reasons that even if these technicalities, even if the law didn't exist, and I don't like calling it a technicality because it's the law. The law says if you vote down the, the comprehensive plan amendment, you cannot pass rezoning. That's not a technicality. That's a law. But moving on to the substance, what our folks have always talked about, and I know you've been told by the folks that are, that are uh, trying to persuade you for, for Pulte that Colony Park has been inconsistent, that we want, we keep moving the ball, that we can't be satisfied. That is not true. I have gone back, I've only been involved since May, okay? But I've gone back and looked at notes of these meetings from the past and, the, and these folks have been remarkably consistent in what they've asked for. They've asked for the floodplain force being left alone, and you heard about that with Witherspoon Rose Culture. You heard some good testimony about how important bottomland hardwood forest is. That's one of the most important wetland types in the southeastern United States. This is a beautiful piece of it. Pulte proposes to cut down most of it for no good reason. We've asked for that to be protected. Number two, we've asked for a reasonable transition from Colony Park's two units per acre to the denser development. And third, we've asked for the site not to be masqueraded or clear cut and for more civilized methods of lot clearing, grading, and stormwater control to be used. We had a few other requests, but we, we put those aside and focused on those three, and we've been consistent on those requests. Pulte has said no to all of them. They have not granted any of our requests. Now, they have moved a little bit on the transition, as you know, and you've heard about repeatedly from their side, but what we asked for was eight to ten to match up with the eight that are there, eight to ten new houses backing up to eight existing houses. Haven't come close to that. So we've been consistent. We've asked for the same things. Uh, Kathy Bertan is here to talk about the stormwater issues. I'm going to let her do most of that. Right now, I'm going to talk about density a little bit. Colony Park's approximately 1.6 homes per acre, lots of 0.6 acres each. If we take these 19 houses and the lot sizes that we've been told that we'd have, 50 by 110 feet, each lot's 0.126 acres. That is 7.9 homes per acre, which is nearly a 500% increase in density in that immediate strip. So ironically, even though you're being asked for a 3.67 something, zoning, the actual strip that's adjacent to us, if you do the math, is a 500 percent increase. Well, Pulte may say what we put a buffer in. So if you, inc if you include the 50-foot buffer, making those lots 50 by 160, then you've got an 8,000 square foot lot, and that comes out to 5.4 homes per acre, which is a 340 percent increase in density. Finally, the change that they've offered from, 19, from 23 homes to 19 homes, that was 23 30-foot homes, 19 38-foot homes. I'm not going to belabor it, but they've actually, they're actually putting more lineal feet of homes next to Colony Park than was originally proposed. So instead of a decrease, it's actually an increase in what's actually there. Stormwater. Um, I just want to talk to you briefly, Ms. Bertan, Dr. Bertan is going to talk to you in more detail, but I want to say a few things very quickly about this, um, about Pulte in particular. Trinity Ridge is a neighborhood up the hill from Colony Park. As I think you may remember, when it was built, it caused flooding in Colony Park. This is the uh, front page of one of their storm stormwater analysis. The person who signed off on that was Jared Edens, the same person who be signing off on this new development for Pulte. That doesn't mean Mr. Edens did anything illegal or wrong. It simply means that having a professional engineer like Mr. Edens sign off on these things does not mean you're not going to have a problem. It means that the regulations have been complied with. And Ms. Baritan is going to talk to you about the difference between complying with regulations and actually not having a stormwater problem. Here's what happened in 2011 after Trinity Park was built, after a stormwater plan had been approved, signed off by Mr. Edens, and so forth flooding like that. I also want to just tell you a little bit about Pulte. You may not know these things. Pulte Group Incorporated is a Michigan corporation. Uh, they've been sued by the US EPA for widespread stormwater violations. This is a copy of a pleading um, 
filed by US EPA in five states against Pulte Homes complaining about widespread stormwater violations. This is a, um, a piece from a, uh, a, a news site about a, uh, a uh, jury verdict in Georgia against Pulte for stormwater violations. And remember, note that I'm talking about stormwater violations, which is what we're worried about, not some random thing. Repe and it says repeated violations of the Georgia Erosion and Sedimentation Control Act. The jury actually concluded that Pulte specifically intended to harm the families living downstream and awarded punitive damages. Finally, from Law 360, a legal um, news site reports that a Georgia judge imposed sanctions on Pulte Group for destruction of electronic evidence in an environmental lawsuit over stormwater runoff. In other words, not only are they causing, causing stormwater runoff, they don't play by the rules. They destroy evidence. So that's the kind of thing we're talking about nationally. Here locally, I talked to the Upper Noose Riverkeeper today, Matthew Starr. He says he's observed failures of their stormwater controls out at Briar Creek after nearly every rainfall event. There's some pictures of some of that very quickly. All right, those are the ends of my slides. I want to conclude very quickly by saying that you instructed Pulte at the end of the April meeting to work with the neighbors to satisfy these folks' concerns. They did not do that. They did not reach out to these neighbors one time, not at all. These folks tried to contact Pulte, got no response. They finally hired me. I called Patrick Biker, and Patrick did talk to me, but it took hiring a lawyer to get a response from Pulte after you had instructed them specifically to work with these neighbors. Now, I met with Patrick and, and Pulte. Uh, Bob Anderson was the Pulte representative there. I asked about our concerns. I said, can we talk about fewer houses on the border? Response, crossed arms, no. I asked, can we talk about masquerading? No. Can we talk about clear cutting? No. Can we talk about keeping the stormwater structures out of the floodplain? No. So, Pulte showed disdain for what you told them to do. Instead, they've spent their time trying to convince and persuade you to ignore what we're telling you. And I would implore you not to do that. This is not a referendum on infill development. This is not a referendum on should this site be developed. This is a question of should Pulte Corporation be allowed to do this specific thing they're asking you to do, which is destroy a lot of the floodplain woods, put in masquerading, put in clear cutting, have 19 houses right next to these folks, eight houses and so forth. I've got, I have personally spoken with a lawyer, Cater Howard, a prominent lawyer in Raleigh who represents a development group that wants to develop this the right way. They're standing back because they don't want to be accused of interfering with the contract, but they're ready to go if Pulte steps out of the picture. There are better people out there than Pulte, and we ask you in the interest of Durham to wait for that better person because they're there waiting to work with you. Thank you. We, we're going to abide by the time frame that we set up, and the proponents had 15 minutes, the opponents had 15 minutes. You only got 18 seconds. Um, so I'm going to move back to the proponents if you want to have anything to say on your remaining time, unless you want to spend 18. Point one eight seconds saying something. We will say one thing that would only take 18 seconds, right. if you would allow it. Sure. And I just wanted to, to say this, that um, I've been to this property. There is absolutely a way to develop this property uh, in a way that would make a profit for the developer, would preserve property values and quality of life for the neighboring communities, and would keep Durham from having to pay down the road to fix what gets broken. That's site sensitive, low impact design, uh, and it's possible at this site, Pulte's plan is not that plan to do that. Thank you. How much time do the proponents have? If the proponents want to speak, you have seven minutes. Otherwise, I'm going to move it to the council <coughs> comments. Uh, again, if, if a council person wants to ask a question of someone, that's a different issue. But right now, we're just going with the time we have allocated.
Mayor Bell, members of City Council, my name is Patrick Biker, again representing Pulte. I wish to rebut a number of the contentions that were uh, just made on behalf of the neighborhood. Um, first of all, if you research the record, um, you'll find that Pulte has never had to, has never been fined in North Carolina. They have also provided 30 homes for returning veterans across our country, two of them in the Triangle, and they even hold a golf tournament to pay the, cover the cost of the property taxes for those new homes. So in terms of being a corporate citizen, in addition to the affordable housing property you made, they certainly do what they can to give back to our community. I also want to address the um, consistency or consistency with Colony Park. Here again is the slide. What has been conveniently left out of this analysis is the fact that this property abuts a freeway. There needs to be a transition from R20 to a major limited access freeway serving our community and 3.67 units per acre is a reasonable transition as is stated in your staff report. Jared Eden will talk more about the floodplain conditions. However, it is hyperbole to say, say that most of the floodplain would be cut down by Pulte. It is a, um, out of the, what is it, Jared, 13 acres of floodplain we have? It's a, a small percentage of that that would be affected uh, with um, constructed wetlands to serve as stormwater infrastructure. And so we definitely take exception to the characterizations. I hope we've pointed that, those out, but in closing, I do want to say that representative, representatives of Pulte met with representatives, representatives of the neighborhood 10 times in order to work on this issue. Um, they were cordial meetings, but at the end of those 10 meetings, it was time to uh, move forward and present our case to the City Council, as we've done here. Mr. Connor and I did have a meeting. It was um, lasted 90 minutes, I'd say, and so it was a fair and frank discussion of the issues. However, we would object to the characterizations on the floodplain issues, and now Mr. Edens will go into that in more detail. Good evening. Uh, Jared Edens with Edens Land Corp. Uh, yeah, and just to re reiterate what Patrick said, um, I know Mr. Connor has, has only been working on this for a month or so, so I can understand he may not have as much information as I do. I've been working on this about two years and I have had 10 meetings directly with the neighbors. And we have made tremendous efforts to appease the concerns that we've heard from the neighbors. Tremendous efforts. You don't, we don't come up with a list of committed elements just because we want to. We come up with a list of committed elements because we're trying to address concerns from our neighbors. Uh, I do want to point out possibly one of the few things that I, that I believe we agreed on during the process was I don't think anyone wants to see Tanglewood Drive constructed extended from Colony Park through the floodplain into this project. Uh, so I just thought it was ironic that the interconnectivity was pointed to as a reason not to approve the zoning when common sense dictates that we don't extend a paper street that's well into the floodplain into the property. And I believe we had agreement with our neighbors on that. So I just found that ironic to be a reason not to approve the zoning. As far as the floodplain goes, um, people like to walk around and say that's wetlands. Look, that's wetlands. It's wetlands. Well, we have to pay professional consultants to determine what's wetlands and what's not. And then after those consultants do their job, the Corps of Engineers, with permission from the property owner, because they can't go into the property without written permission from the property owner, the Corps of Engineers follows up those determinations and verifies whether they're correct or not. So we've had two site visits with a, a paid professional, SNEC, who does tons of work in this area, very respected environmental firm. They delineated a total of 0.15 acres of wetlands on the entire property. 0.15 acres, confirmed by the Corps of Engineers. So I would urge you not to just listen to someone who says there's eight to 10 acres of wetlands down there and take it at face value. That's not the case. We pay consultants to, to delineate it. The Corps verified it. It's 0.15 acres. And those acres are considered non-jurisdictional by the Corps, meaning they can be impacted with no permit whatsoever. No 401, no 404, none of those issues. Um, anyways, I just want to speak to those two items. If you had additional questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Let, let me ask the staff a question, if you don't mind, because that was one of the questions I had in looking at the report. Uh, this about interconnectivity, uh, Tanglewood, um, 
What, what, what is the staff's position on that, given what I just heard the developer say? There's no one in their right mind would want to run a extended street through Tanglewood. You didn't say it that way, but you get to just what I was saying. Sure. Steve Madlin with the Durham City County Planning Department. Um, Mayor Bell, uh, certainly staff does acknowledge that the existing Tanglewood stub out, which stub outs to this, this property, is problematic from the perspective that it is located in sensitive environmental areas. Um, actually, during the course of our conversations with the applicant, we suggested to them that it would probably make some sense for them to close, to work with the neighborhood and close that section of Tanglewood to take it off the books, in essence, so there would no longer be a stub out connection. However, what we have is a policy that requires interconnection to existing stub outs in adjacent properties. And that's what uh, Mr. Edens was referring to, uh, that the, the policy in the comprehensive plan and in the unified development warrants requires that, interconnect that connection if there is a presence of a stub out. So I, I guess what I'm missing, I thought one of the points that the staff was making as to why they didn't support the plan was because they couldn't make the connection. They wouldn't make the connection. They have not made that connection on their development plan. That is correct. But I, I guess I'm, I thought you said, maybe I'm missing something. Would you recommend that they make the connection or not? I thought you said what they should do is close it, close the stuff out. I think speaking strictly from the staff's perspective, yeah. we would probably advocate that the applicant in this case close that stub out, remove the requirement for that stub out connection. Uh, if that happens, then the policy and the ordinance provision would no longer be applicable to that connection. So did the developer propose that or not? Well, Patrick Pike with Morning Star Law Group, my understanding is that to close the right-of-way for Tanglewood would require the signatures of the adjoining property owners. I believe that's the case. It would require at least one of the adjacent property owners to be party to that right, street and closing. Those are the yeah. persons that are opposing this development, so I, I doubt they would be inclined to agree with that procedure I, I, I got my answer are there other comments questions of either developers or the opponents uh, opponents I, I, before I close the public hearing that's, that's what I'm trying to see where we are you, you had a question I was just going to make a comment well, you're free to make a comment yeah if, if we could Mayor Bell we would be um, happy to proffer on the record a trail easement uh, to provide Oh, I'm sorry, it's on our development plan. There's a proffer for a trail easement, so there'd be pedestrian connectivity from um, Colony Woods to the uh, trail system in, in this uh, development. Okay. We, we, we're asking these questions, but I, I think the foregoing conclusion is that it would be inappropriate for the council to approve this rezoning matter simply because it doesn't comply with the com comprehensive plan, but Having said that, I'm still going to recognize the Mayor Pro Tem for comments and anyone else before I call for a motion. Um, um, the attorney for the Colony Park, I uh, just want to um, tell you that we are sorry for your loss. Thank you very much, Mayor Pro Tem. I appreciate yes, that. It looks like, despite that, you managed to do a lot of work on this project. So that's all, though. It's a very neutral comment. Thank you Nothing very much. Else. I appreciate that. I'm going to close the public hearing on this rezoning matter, and matters back before the council would entertain a motion on the item. I recognize Councilman Shul. Do you want to? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I, believe, I agree it's a foregone conclusion, and, um, but I did want to make some comments because I've been thinking about it a lot, and I spent a lot of time on it, and I didn't want to waste it without having to say a few words about it. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me just Somebody start. Somebody asked me what time we were going to get out here tonight. I, 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 <laughs> it was a Mi staff person. Mr. Mayor, I'll keep it under an hour. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> the, um, I, I just, I, I do have one thing, just kind of, I don't know, of a personal nature to say. Mr. Connor, which is, I have to tell you that I think the, the, the talking about Mr. Edens signing that off and then showing the, the flooding down at the bottom of the hill and implying that was something because of what he signed off on Trinity Ridge, honestly, strikes me, sir, as a, as a pretty cheap shot. 
Uh, I don't think any of us who know that area, and everyone here knows it very well, and I've been out there, knows that the flooding, it's, that, that area you showed is in the floodplain. Uh, and there's flooding there that has nothing to do with, with Trinity Ridge. Uh, I know that Trinity Ridge is a problem, and I know that the, that the, that the uh, stormwater there is a problem, but I also know that the flooding down there at the bottom of that hill is, is way, way more than what's happening at Trinity Ridge, and so I just felt I needed to say that to you. Um, I think there's a lot of good about this. We need the housing. Um, we need it at this price point. I agree that we need the for sale. I think that the location is good. I do, th I do think it's infill. I think the affordable housing at 60% is a, is a, is a significant um, offer, as are the trail easements. Um, and all of those things, I think, are good. And I look forward to um, a development here that um, I think is uh, more appropriate for this site. The, I will also say just a couple of other things. The buffer. Um, you know, I've struggled a lot with the buffer, the 50-foot buffer with the 60% opacity. Uh, and I finally thought a lot about where I live. I live on Club Boulevard. My, my, my yard is deep, but I live in a place where it's not as deep as some because there's a house about 200, 200 feet behind mine. Um, and there's another house that also is in back of me, so there are two houses behind me. Um, and there's no, there's no opacity, essentially. I, I see them pretty much all the time. Um, and it's okay. It's okay. And I think that a 50-foot buffer with 60% opacity, even with the number of houses behind uh, the houses there at the buffer w is a reasonable offer. I don't think it's, it's not perfect, it's not great, it's not as good as living with no one behind you, um, but to be honest, it's the way I live, and I think it's the way most people in the city live, and it's okay. So I thought that that was pretty reasonable. I also think on the traffic, just when this comes back in some form, I, I do want to say that I know that it's busy at 15501 in Cornwallis at rush hour, um, but we wouldn't be developing anything in Durham at all if we voted against this development because of traffic. There's just, compared to most of the proposals we get and most of the city that we live in, there's not much. And you all have been the beneficiaries of it and I understand why you want it. Same with the buffer, I understand it. But I also don't think that those are reasons to defeat this development. I do think that there are things about it that are very problematic. Uh, the clear cutting, uh, on the other hand, that's our ordinance. And uh, we, I'm, I'm happy to say that as a result of you all being here the first time, uh, we have, uh, as you all probably remember, I raised that issue then, and the city manager and our planning department has put on our planning department's work plan for this year and uh, alterations to our clear cutting ordinance, uh, which I think will be very beneficial, and I know they'll do a great job. Um, my, the stormwater, uh, I've spent way too much time uh, in the uh, stormwater department's offices this past couple of days, and I want to thank them for putting up with me um, and uh, talking also to Dr. Baratan and uh, Dr. Richardson. Um, I, I, you know, there's a lot of way to cut, there's a lot of ways to cut this, and I think that um, the developers, uh, let me put it like this. Dr. Richardson talks about stream restoration, and stream restoration is great. Um, but it's also, it's not in our regulations, and we don't require it of anyone else. Is it fair to require it of this developer? And I would say no. I, I just want to say that in general, I just think we need to be really careful to be fair to all of our developers. People need to come in and they need to have the expectation they can develop on the base, same basis as everyone else. Um, the developer, um, yeah, our staff says that, um, well, let me, let me just cut to the chase. Um, one, one other thing. Colony Park itself, as you all are aware, has no stormwater treatment. 
You're, you have your neighborhood has no stormwater treatment. Um, as you also know, there's some building of from your neighborhood in the floodplain. In your neighborhood, and yet we ask the de this developer under new under different and new regulations uh, to develop stormwater treatments. Your neighborhood is something the stormwater that comes out of your neighborhood and runs down into those creeks will be something that Durham, the city of Durham, is paying to, to, to remediate with our Jordan Lake rules. And so I just want to say that it's important to be aware of the role that we all play in this. Um, so the reason that I think of, in the end, that, um, that causes me to uh, come down on the side of not supporting this is I think it is possible to put a development there that doesn't take the trees out of the floodplain, and I think we can get something better for our whole community. But I also think we, I, I do want to say, I said it before, that when the right development for residential comes back here, I do plan to support it. And um, I actually uh, will look forward to that because I think that infill development is really important. It's either that or sprawl. We have two choices. And so to me, that's good planning. I know it's, it's bad for the forest and it's bad for those of you all who live next to it. Um, I also want to say one thing, one other thing about, we, to my colleagues and, and to the audience, which is we voted already tonight uh, on the Doc Nichols Road rezoning for a project that has constructed wetlands, that will have constructed wetlands in the floodplain. The same thing that we're saying tonight here that we don't want. And I will say that the inconsistency bothers me, and the inconsistency is driven by a lot of different things, but I look for that consistency. I like to find it, because I think, I, I, think, I like to treat everyone, all of our developers fairly. We can go beyond, because it's a rezoning request, we can go beyond what our ordinance is, and I, that's what I think is important here, that we try to get something that's better than what the ordinance allows. Uh, but I do think it's a difficult position that we put ourselves in, which on one night, we approve something which has constructed wetlands in the floodplain in order to handle the stormwater, while at the same time, on that same night, it's a big objection to why we're not doing it somewhere else. On one, it's important to also think about it's organized and there are 100 people sitting in the audience. On the other, that wasn't true. So that's a tribute to you. Um, anyway, there you go, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other comments? If not, uh, recognize Councilman. Uh, I just want to comment very briefly. I appreciate all the comments that Councilman Schulz made, and I really appreciate the work that he's put into trying to understand the issues around stormwater. I think it's really important. We look at the, we, we listen very carefully to the people in the community. We look at the issues that are affecting you, and then we try to do what we think is best for the entire city when we make the decisions that we do. Um, and uh, certainly, uh, I think there's a lot in this project um, that has been proffered to commend it. That, um, But I will say that I do think, in, I'm not an attorney, I've learned that <laughs> uh, in big time. I've learned several things over the last few weeks. One, that we could renew uh, a motion. We did that two weeks ago. Um, two, that we can't renew a no motion that was, we can only renew a motion that's been defeated. And, uh, and three, that the UDO had this provision in it in the first place. So um, I do think that um, in this case our hands are tied. Um, I do have the same concerns that Councilman Schul does. So um, uh, I, I don't see how we can vote to approve this given what the UDO says and given the current state of things. Um, but uh, if we do see something again, I, I hope that we see all of these things. I do want to say one more thing, which is regarding the stub out, um, what the staff said was that any adjoining property owner could request that the stub out be closed and the, one of the adjoining property owners is the property, the subject property of the rezoning. So they, they could have and could still request the closing of that stub out in the future. Thank you. 
I think this going once, going twice. Just trying to figure out what motion we. The, the motion to be, if you are voting to defeat the rezoning, the motion would be in the affirmative to uh, agree to the zoning, and if you then vote against it. So the, the motion would be to approve the rezoning request for the purpose of defeating it by voting against it. And you're voting against it not because of all the technicalities we've heard, the goodness, and we, we, you'll be voting against it simply because it doesn't comply with our comprehensive plan. Yeah, sure. He, he, had, he had some time left. a uh, few hours and uh, we would request a, a deferral to work with the city attorney on this and also to evaluate um, the possibility of removing our stormwater BMPs from the floodplain and putting them in the non floodplain areas we haven't had a chance to evaluate that sir if you don't this mind can you give the courtesy of the speaker to speak it, it, thank you it's this is new information that's come in over the last few hours and it's uh, been very difficult for our team to an analyze this we've worked you know hand in glove with council member Shule to analyze this floodplain issue very carefully if that is in fact something that would be dispositive on this we would welcome the chance to evaluate the potential to move forward with with doing that even though it is different from the uh, um, the case out on Doc Nichols Road that that isn't the issue the I issues, understand, sir. The issue is the fact that we have a conference plan that this does not agree with. And if we listen to our attorneys, uh, we couldn't vote to support the rezoning has been proposed. So I, I'm going to close the discussion on that. The matter is back before the council, entertain a motion on the rezoning of this issue. Mr. Mayor, if I might, I believe the motion's already on the floor, and I'll second it. It's been properly moved and seconded that you want to state it? We approve the rezoning. That's it. Okay. Uh, all those in favor, Madam Clerk, we open up. And the motion would, has been made, it's been seconded, and to defeat it, you would vote negative. So the vote, is it open? Can you open it again? My lights aren't flashing. Well, somebody voted for me. No, I didn't vote. Okay. <laughs> all right, the, the, the motion is defeated. Let's move on to the next item, please. We're back to the items that have been pulled. And if you could uh, depart quietly while we continue the meeting, we appreciate it. Uh, item five. Uh, uh, nobody's asking you to leave. I'm saying if you're going to leave, leave quietly. If you're going to stay, stay quietly. We, meanwhile, we're going to move on to the next item, which is item five, which was pulled. Item five is fiscal year 2016-2017 budget and 2017-2022 capital improvement plan. Uh, I have Stephen Hopkins, V. Peterson, who have pulled item five. Is Steve Hopkins, he's, he's gone? Oh, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, three minutes. Mr. Mayor, can I ask a quick question, point of order here? Um, it's my understanding, this is the, the, uh, the budget item, correct? This is, the bu this is the budget yes. he's speaking on. Um, I wasn't aware that we would allow folks to pull that item and speak since we already had it's a on, it's, on a, it's a consent item, though. Fair enough. Thank you. Steve Hopkins, uh, 617 Mimosa, uh, 27703. And all I just wanted to say, uh, I haven't heard anything from any of the PACs about the police 
headquarters or the 20 men that the police department wants to add. And I want to go on record as uh, the District 1 co-facilitator and say that I support the uh, police headquarters being built on the site that it is. I do also support the police department getting 20 new officers because we do not feel safe in the community. Every week there's a shooting somewhere in Northeast Central. And usually it's coming from Oakley Square. You know, and something needs to be done. Now, until the, the city and the county can come up with an economic uh, development plan and an equity, a racial equity plan, we need more officers on the street. Now, I, I, to the chief, I want to say to you personally that I like the fact that we got substations in the community. I want a man. And I'm hoping that these 20 officers will go to man those substations. Okay? And the city council, please, we're not there yet. We do not feel safe here in Durham totally. Now, they do in some parts of Durham, but over in District 1, not yet. Thank you. Welcome. We're moved to Ms. V. Uh, Peterson. I'm Mrs. Peterson, Victoria Peterson. Um, I'm in total disagreement, and uh, I usually, Steve and I are usually sort of on the same page. Uh, this city does not need to build a, uh, a $71 million police station. That is ridiculous. We have some serious, and Steve, besides East Durham, I live over by North Carolina Central University. Uh, one of the greatest universities in this country, has one of the best law schools in this country. And over in the Meduga Terrace area, and I want my white citizens to know this also, because we don't have white neighbors that live on that side of town. We have young black kids that are dying on the streets, and I'm glad some of you have stayed. Please continue to come come to these meetings. We need your help also. This city council needs to hear, not just from black folk, but they need to hear from the white residents that live in this city. Our black children are dying on the streets of this community. And many of us are taxpayers. My husband and I, we pay taxes in this city. We pay county taxes. We pay city taxes. We pay federal taxes. And black boys are dying on the streets of this community. And I don't hear very few people coming to this city council, asking our mayors, asking these city officials, what in the world are you doing about it? Tell me why is it every week a black child is shot in this city? Tell me why. Somebody answer that for me. We have a police station. We have, uh, we have police officers. We have deputies. But black men are dying in this community. Tell me why. We have the majority of that city council look like me. I haven't seen... I, I haven't seen not one city council member the last three months down in McDougal Terrace. The shooting and the killing that is going on in this community is outrageous. And we talk about, um, I'm sorry, we talk about stuff that's going on in the Middle East. It's ridiculous. We talk about people that are murdered in other states all around this country, but black kids and, and people we can't even sit on our porches in our community two and three o'clock at night, um, I'm sorry, two and three o'clock in the morning, guns are going off. Guns that wake, that wake myself up and the senior residents that live on my street. Something has to be done in this community. We talk about building developments, building this, building that. How can we build when our children are dying and being murdered on these streets? Thank you, Ms. Peterson. And every time I turn around, we bring in a new police chief. Thank we need thank more than the police chief. Ms. Peterson, 
No, you, you know, no, I don't. I, I don't. I don't. I don't want you to sit down because you got the next item. But we need to act on this item. Uh, you don't have to sit. Down. I, I want you to do something. Uh, I want Ms. you Ms. to Ms. allow if, if some money. If you if you quiet down, let's act on this item. Then you go in to hear your other one. And I, I would just say, just because you don't see me in McDougal Terrace doesn't mean I'm not in McDougal Terrace. I don't let's hear let, you, Mr. Mayor, and I don't see you down there because I, I go said, down there. Yeah, I, I say you don't see me in a lot of places. Uh, You're right. Uh, I don't. Entertain a motion on this item, please. Move it. Second. Did you, you have a comment? I just have a comment. Oh, recognize the city manager. I, I just wanted to clarify for the record, uh, ask uh, Ms. Johnson to uh, indicate in, in this, uh, uh, the tax rates associated with the uh, business improvement district, what is the tax rate that is incorporated in this motion should it pass? Yes. Good afternoon. Bertha Johnson, Director of Budget and Management Services. The rate that is currently uh, proposed in the bid and will be um, the rate, if you adopt the budget as is, will be seven cents per 100 assessed value, which is not the revenue neutral rate. It is a rate that's proposed to keep the same rate in the bid with no changes. And this, and then you'll get the the um, DDI contract at a later date. Thank you, Councilman Moffitt. Yes, I wanted to just take a minute um, and uh, talk for a moment about the Bull City Connector. I want to first thank the members of Spirit House who brought this issue forward and the Human Relations Commission for the work and recommendations regarding the Bull City Connector. You might have seen, for those of you who don't get uh, memos from uh, HRC, you might have seen in the paper today a story on that. Um, the current alignment of the Bull City Connector was approved in last year's budget. And I recognize the HRC's concern that there may only be one opportunity to affect change, which is in the budget. However, although the last change to the route appeared to happen suddenly. It came after long consideration and work, including community tr meetings, uh, all done by Go Triangle. They're now in the process of planning a study to create a five-year transit plan that will include all of Go Durham, including the Bull City Connector. We simply don't have enough information now to make route changes, but I'm, and I'm guessing that among impacts that we'll hear about eventually will be longer bus headways and higher operating costs, but we'll see. Um, and possibly the funding structure. But I want to take a moment and observe there's concern that the fare free bus route serves Duke more than any other segment. Uh, I will point out that they now stop at the Veterans Administration Hospital, which is really important. And while Duke affiliated residents can ride it for free, they can also ride any Go Durham bus for free. But so can students, faculty, and staff at North Carolina Central University and Durham Tech, and any, they, any Go Durham bus and any youth under the age of 12, and seniors over the age of 65, all fare free, any bus. All that said, we invest three quarters of a million dollars in the Bull City Connector, and I want to be sure that we're investing it wisely. I'm hoping that when the five-year transit plan is presented to us, we will have numerous options among them, returning the Bull City Connector to its original route, or retaining the current route, or modifying the current route, or eliminating the Bull City Connector altogether, and even considering expanding the number of routes that are designated for fair free travel for everyone. Thank you. You're welcome. Recognize Councilwoman Johnson. Mr. Mayor, is it possible for um, additional residents to speak on the item? Look, I, 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 anybody wants to speak that has signed up to speak, no one else has signed up to speak on that. Uh, no, let, let me let me let, 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 no, let me let me let me explain that, please. Let me explain that, please. On public hearings is when I ask if there anyone else wants to speak to have an opportunity. This is a carcinogen item, and unless someone pulls it, then it's up to the council to decide what they, what they want to do. Now, ha ha having, said, having said that, did you want to speak on this carcinogen item? Go ahead. The, well, the carcinogen item is on the budget. That's what I guess you want to speak on. And you have three minutes. Thank you for that. I misunderstood, and that's why I didn't fill out the card. All right. um, I understand that the vote is about to happen and that you all have probably um, made the decisions that you've made, and unfortunately, it's not going to go the way that we want. I want to make a point, which, you know, last night I was watching a documentary with Angela Davis and Toni Morrison, and Toni Morrison said, when we put people in prison, we no longer have to think about the person who has caused the harm, but we also no longer have to think about addressing the problem. Hiring more police officers in Durham is not addressing the problems that we have here around violence. You know, I, I again beg to differ with Steve. I understand his concerns, but
but increasing police officers, particularly increasing police officers here in Durham, when the police department has done little to nothing to address the racial um, disparity issues that we've brought before the council time and time and time and time again. Um, last, at the last council meeting, Tia brought up the fact that the um, resist, delay, and obstruct uh, use of force that the police department uses is 90% young African American males that are being arrested for release, delay, and obstruct. So again, the issues around race and racial profiling, racial disparities still exist here. And by increasing these police officers that you're about to hire, then let's be perfectly clear and perfectly honest. They're not going to be riding around in Hope Valley. They're not going to be riding around in Treyburn. They're going to be riding around in the same neighborhoods that are having the issues that we've been talking about. Now, the city is spending uh, $850,000 on ambassadors for downtown Durham. That's a wonderful thing to happen. But why aren't we spending that same amount of money, which is about going to be comparable to the 20 police officers that you're hiring, to hire community members to be ambassadors of their own streets? These folks need jobs. These young people, and, and you know, again, this idea around mentoring and the folks who come in here to protest, everyone who I know who has come in here to protest does do work with children. We do a lot of work with children, and we also work with formerly incarcerated individuals, helping to employ them, helping them to find jobs, and helping them to be on the streets, making their streets safe. They do that on a voluntary basis. They're not being paid for that. But if they were going to be able to be paid for that and have a livable wage and a benefit, you would find out that the communities would be much safer, that the people who come back to the neighborhoods that live in these neighborhoods want safe neighborhoods. These young men who have made mistakes in their past, who are now returning home, want to make their home safe for themselves and for their children. Videotapes of police officers dancing on Cheek Road, you know, that, that makes us all feel good, but that's the same officer who will also bust in somebody's door, and that same child, that violence that you're talking about, them witnessing and experiencing, they're witnessing and experiencing from police officers also. So what I, I would ask you to, again, reconsider what you're about to vote on around approving for new police officers and listen to the voices of the community. At the last meeting, you had a lot of community members asking you not to approve of this. And, you know, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Welcome. Let, let me, uh, I, 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 can I? <laughs> just, no, just, just a minute, please. I'm going to rec recognize Councilman Reese, and then I'll make some Did you want to speak on the budget? No, we're, no, we're not going to do that. If you can, want to speak on the budget, you're free to do that. This is a consent. This is this is a consent agenda item. If you want to speak on the budget, yes, that's fine. Okay, that's fine. Uh, you have three minutes. Just state your name and address, please. My name is Kathy Bridge. Um, I was a resident of in Colony Park. Um, we need restorative justice. We need ways to work together. We need a way to build um, community so that people feel like something has changed rather than just um, arresting people. There will be more of these officers coming down Colony Park and going through other areas in white neighborhoods, but they're protecting them. They're not going and arresting them. We had at Colony Park, we had a couple of break-ins. A police officer showed up at one of our um, meetings and some person sitting in our um, community said, well, if somebody comes to my house and tries to break in, can I kill them? Can I shoot them and kill them? And the officer looked at him and said, I would. I got up and left. It makes me sick. And I know what color they're talking about. Recognize Councilman Reese. Um, I'm going to address what Ms. Wilson was talking about in a minute. First of all, I wanted to thank all of our city staff and all their hard work in preparing this budget. Um, I want to single out for special recognition our budget director, Bertha Johnson, our deputy city manager, Wanda Page, and of course, our city manager, Tom Bonfield. This is a budget that is in large part a collaboration with the people of Durham. Um, this process begins in February, uh, many months ago, with a series of meetings across the city in different parts of our city uh, to collect public input from ordinary citizens about what they want to see out of their budget and their priorities for the next fiscal year. Uh, we've had a number of public hearings on the budget. We've had a number of budget retreats, supplementary work sessions dealing with the budget that were uh, open to the public and noticed appropriately on our city uh, calendar of, of business, all of which is to say that there's been significant public input on this budget. 
um, and the process that we've used to develop it has been transparent and open for public review. Having said all that, I, I think we really need to do a lot more uh, to make folks aware of the issues uh, surrounding our budget, the process that we use, uh, aware of the opportunities that exist for public engagement on the budget. Uh, but I have to say that as a newcomer to the council, I was, uh, uh, frankly myself, found the learning curve to be pretty steep. And I can only imagine what it's like for folks in the community who are trying to approach this budget document for the first time without the benefit that we all have, which is to pick up the phone and call the city manager or call our budget director anytime we have a question. Uh, so that's why I strongly support the cre creation of a participatory budgeting process here in Durham for the next fiscal year, similar to that that was used this year in the city of Greensboro, and I know we're going to have that conversation in the weeks and months to come. Um, this is not a perfect budget. Nothing that is created by human hands can be perfect. Um, and I want to make sure that everyone understands that I don't believe anyone on this council thinks that this budget meets all of our individual priorities or particular product policy predilections or can meet the demands that were placed on us in the many, many volumes of community input that we received in this process. But there is a lot to be uh, proud of in this budget uh, with respect to the increased investment in the, in the dedicated housing fund. We could have left that at the revenue neutral rate of about 92 and 100 cents uh, for every $100 of assessed value. We accelerated that up to the full penny. I think that's important. Um, we're going to begin land acquisition uh, for two really important public trails here in Durham um, and do a trails assessment on the other existing inventory. And I think it's unheralded, but I'm really proud of the work we're doing to invest in our fleet. Uh, it's something that we've uh, underfunded uh, to a certain extent uh, in, in, uh, in order to focus on some other priorities. And now I think we're being really aggressive in a, in a good way to make sure that our services go forward. Um, but I did want to address uh, the, the issues that a number of people in the community have raised at the last public hearing that unfortunately I could not attend and which Ms. Wilson brought into the room for us today, and that is the hiring of 20 new police officers. Um, I know that there are many uh, residents of the city who oppose that and many that support it. Mr. Hopkins was here speaking on it. Um, some of the folks who oppose that are uh, here in the room tonight. Some of them I consider friends and allies in this work. Um, and to those of you who are suspicious of the hiring of these officers, I would say this. Like the budget, the Durham Police Department is not a perfect tool. Um, it's full of imperfect humans who uh, have the biases that they have, and we've done the work to, uh, to demonstrate what folks in FADE and the community have been telling us for many years, that these biases exist and that they have to be addressed. Um, I believe uh, that even though the department is not perfect, um, we have to work as a city to make it work better for the people of this city. Um, I believe the hiring of these new officers will permit the department to respond more quickly to emergency calls for service in every part of our city. Uh, they will uh, also help the department clear more open criminal cases. Moreover, one of these 20 officers is, um, will be a community liaison officer uh, dedicated specifically to Northeast Central Durham. Um, and that's been a request that's made by the uh, Mayor's Poverty, Poverty Reduction Initiative the Public Safety Committee, of which I am the co-chair. Uh, I also believe that some of the other measures included in the budget that Ms. Wilson did not mention that would aid in officer retention here in Durham to keep our officers here longer, to encourage officers to live within the communities they serve, I believe those measures will also improve the work of our police department in our community. And I would, while I know there's disagreement on this um, here in Durham, in many parts of our city, I believe that a true community policing model is the only way to rebuild the relationship of trust and confidence between our police and the people of this city. And that kind of community policing model requires more officers to maintain a consistent level of service with the emergency calls that officers have to meet. Now listen, I'm not under any illusion about whether I've been able to convince you or anybody else within the sound of my voice that this is a good idea. I myself would have preferred to see a corresponding increase uh, dollar for dollar in city services that address the root causes of crime additional job training, uh, and more low and no cost recreational program for young people. But as I mentioned, this is not a perfect process or a perfect budget. There's any number of changes I would have made. Um, but this budget is a good start on the investments we have to make as a city during the next four, during the four years of my term on this city council. And I just promise the people of this city that I won't stop working hard to make sure that next year's budget is better than this one. Thank you. I, I, I'm not going to prolong it. I know you, and I appreciate the work that you do on behalf of the 
person that you represent, so I'm not questioning that. I'm not questioning sincerity in your heart and what you think. But if I for one moment thought that hiring additional 20 police officers was going to result in what you're suggesting it might result, I wouldn't be here voting for it. Uh, we're going to have to have a change in this community. We've got a new chief in town. I think she understands the concerns that you've raised and the concerns that we've raised. So I would only ask that you follow us, follow the results. You've got a year to do that and see where we are. But if I for one moment thought that hiring 20 new police officers was going to result in what you're saying, no way in the world I'd be up here supporting it. But again, I see it maybe from a different perspective than you do. But the unfortunate thing is that uh, I have to make the decisions. We have to make the decisions. And we have to make it with all the input that comes into us, those four issues, those against issues. And ultimately, we, we end up making decisions. And the only thing that I could ask, and I know you've heard this over and over again, trust what we're saying and look at the results. And I want you to smile. I know a lot of people say, trust me, I understand that. But trust us. Trust us. And if, if, if it doesn't turn out, if it doesn't turn out, come back here and tell us. And you don't have to wait a year. You don't have to wait a year. Come to these city council meetings. They're open to anybody. I, uh, I come to the city council meetings and raise the current concerns. And just because we don't always do what you say doesn't mean we aren't listening. I say that over again. It doesn't mean we aren't listening. But it's just a process that we're going through. Uh, again, I, 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 again, Ms. Peterson, you hear all the time. You speak all the time. You've, I, I'm not going to get into it with you, Ms. Peterson. I'm going to call. Um, I, I, would entertain a, I would entertain a motion on the action that's before us, and that's the item that's been pulled, item five. Um, move the item. It's been, pro it's been properly moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Open the vote. Cl close the vote. Uh, Ms. Peterson, uh, it you, 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 you're up for item eight. Mr. Three Mayor, minutes. before we move on, sure. I just want to underscore what um, Councilman Reese said and really appreciate the work of the entire budget department. I know a lot of people have been involved, and in, although we became involved in February, I know the work really began in November and probably already starting to think about next year. So I just want to once again appreciate the very hard work that all of you have done in many, many meetings. Um, with staff, with us, with the public, and, and thank you. So. Thank you. I recognize V. Peterson proposed FY17 Planning Department Work Program. You have three minutes, Ms. Peterson. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Can somebody set the clock, please? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I think on this program and some of your other programs that you're pushing for that this meeting, um, I do not see the dollar amount in the kind of development. Um, it looks like there are quite a few, I guess, projects that, um, that this uh, proposal for, 20, for 2017. I do not see a workforce development program of who are they planning to hire and put to work. So let me just put it like this. This project here, and you have several other projects. I know several years ago, and I don't hear, hear her or see her too much now here at the city council meeting, um, you had somebody on board to make sure that the, uh, that the equal opportunity or the minority participation was being done on, on some of these projects. Uh, I, I, don't hear, um, I don't hear that too much going on now. And I do not hear or see of our residents being employed to do a lot of this work. Um, <clears throat> I hear all of the different things that are being said about the crime. The only way, there's only several ways that we're going to really take a bite out of crime in this community, and that's to put young men and women that have gotten caught up in the criminal activity in this, in this community is to give them employment and having youth programs, and all that is good. But if you look overall, the age of the young people, Mr. Mayor, and city council members who are out here committing the crime, they're not the babies. They, these are your kids that are 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. These are the kids that were in the public school system. They've dropped out. They have not finished their education, and they have gotten involved with criminal activity. Just sending them to prison and jail, you're not going to get the crime uh, uh, 
I'm sorry, we are not going to get the crime under control in this community. You have to develop programs to put young people to work and pay them a stipend. And I did mention that at the last meeting, dealing with this budget, and there's nothing in this budget to give our young people a stipend. Uh, Ms. Johnson, I haven't heard you say anything about it. Cora, uh, Mr. Davis, we talked about a little bit offline. These young kids need a stipend. If they go to work, they should be paid. A lot of them are stealing because they have uh, court, court fees. They have baby mama fees. They got to take care of their babies. They, they break into your house and they steal stuff so that they can get those dollars and pay their court fees to stay out of prison and stay out of jail. So Mr. Mayor, I was just asking, how has the city put something together on some of these projects to make sure that our young folks are gonna be employed on some of these jobs? And should I just stand here for the next one also? Yes, ma'am, yeah, if you don't mind, Sam. Mr. Mayor. But I recognize. Yeah, the, the item number eight is actually about the planning department's work program, which yes. is their annual plan for uh, undertaking all the work around planning and zoning, and uh, I move approval. Second. It's been a problem to move and second. Madam Clerk, we open the vote. Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. We move to item 25. Ms. Peterson, this is police. Uh, I uh, see that this is to talk a little bit about the police. Oh, I'm sorry. Can somebody set the uh, time, please? 25 is contract for the provision of police psychological services. Ms. Peterson, you pulled that item. Yes, it looks like that the city wants to spend about, um, I think about $86,000 on bringing on a psychiatrist for the police officers. And I think that's great. I think they need that. A psychiatrist, a psychologist. A psychologist. I think that's great, but there's two things here, Mr. Bonfield, and I mentioned this to the city council. When that young man was killed and shot by one of our police officers because the young man was having a mental health issue and how we dealt with that was to shoot him. Many of us in this community totally disagree. We understand, and I don't want anybody to say here that, that Peterson is against police officers. I'm not, I have two degrees in that field. But I do believe that when our residents are having mental health, health issues, we should have someone on staff to go on that site with those police officers to evaluate that situation and help them make some good positive decision, even if they had to bring a family member. And there were family members there, Mr. Bonfield, who wanted to help, and they were not allowed, Mr. Davis. Family members were not allowed to help to calm this young man down and to try to save his life. So yes, there needs to be some mental health there, but also, the families that have been shot and family members and persons in the community like me who have gone to some of these scenes and see bodies laying down, see, see young people, hear the young kids saying that they seen so-and-so shot. Where is the mental health dollars for the citizens in this community, Mr. Bonfield and Mr. Mayor and Mr. City Council members? I think that this dollar amount needs to be increased because persons who live in these communities, we need help also. We need help also. And there may be other persons who may also need mental health. So besides allowing the police officers to get mental health, and Mr. Reeds, I actually have pictures of the house that the police shot all these bullets in the windows. And at that time, Mr. Davis, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Bonfield, and our, my friend, uh, Mr. Baker, the attorney, you should see the gunshots, the bullet holes in this house. And there were people, young men living in that house. 
at the time, the police officers were shooting at that house. There were young men in that house at that time. Thank and you, Mr. I Peterson. Have pictures of it. Th th thank you. you uh, uh, it's been proper to move and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Ms. Peterson, you asked to speak on item 46, a resolution in support of action by the city of Durham addressing violence among youth African-American males. Uh, that's a resolution that was passed, but you have three minutes to speak. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just would like to just sit, share with the city council members as well as with the residents here in Durham. Um, I think it's nice to have a resolution, but that resolution needs to have some dollars to it. When I spoke a few weeks ago, if we're going to build a $71 million police station, Mr. Bonfield, we need to develop some good programs for our young men and women in this community. Um, I hate to say this, but I'm going to say it. I think most black folks in Durham are tired of a whole lot of lip service. I'm out in this community and I speak to a lot of African Americans who come up. And Mr. Mayor, your name is constantly asked about. Me and Mr. Bell. And one of the things I try to tell most African Americans, get involved in our government. Come down here and share your concerns. And I'm gonna say this, I said this the other week, we need somewhere between two to $3,000 a month for a job stipend and training program. When I was a young girl, a young, a young lady at the age of 15 and 16, this was years ago where I used to live up north. When we got in trouble, there were various programs for us, Mr. Davis. That's why I can talk about this. I have personal experience when I was a kid and when I got in trouble with the law as a juvenile. See, see, years ago when you got in trouble with the law and you were 16, 17, 18, 19, or 20, up north, they didn't treat you as an adult. Here in Durham, you're treated as an adult. And once you're treated as an adult, you have a criminal record. Years ago when I was coming up, you were treated as a juvenile. And if you got in trouble as a juvenile, Mr. Davis, it was a closed case. To this day, you could go up north and never find out what I did when I was 15 and 16 and 17 years old. And I thank God for that. That's mercy and grace. But a kid that lives in McDougal Terrace or on Fayetteville Street that gets in trouble here in Durham at the age of 16, 17, and 18, he is considered a criminal for the rest of his life. He or she will never get employment. If they do, it would be, be very hard. Durham needs a job training program that offers good job training and a stipend of somewhere between two to $3,000 a month. I'm going to talk about it. I'm not going to go away on this issue. I'd rather see that happen, Mr. Mayor, than a $71 million police station built. I want to really, truly, Mr. McCora, let's really, truly save our children and put the dollars behind the children and the young people instead of continuing to build buildings and police stations. Thank, thank, thank you, you very Peterson. much. Uh, let me entertain a motion on this item. Thank you, Mr. Oh, yeah, that's right. You passed the resolution. Yeah. It's not 10:30. Let's, <laughs> Miss 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 Peterson. Uh, I was informed that you pulled item 21. Although I don't have a card, and you have one other item that you pulled, item 46. Uh, yeah, that's the one I just. Okay. It was 46, and I can still speak on 21. I just wanted to ask. Um, and when you're reading this report, and here we have again, of, of several organizations that, that's working with the youth, and you see here, 
they're spending about $2,000 a month. I'm sorry, it didn't say a month, I guess a year, on, on each of the 150 children or youth that they're work, uh, uh, working with Mr. Davis. And if you notice that I call Mr. Davis, Mr. Davis is my representative for my area. Right, Mr. Davis? Yes. So Mr. Davis, if you see here, they're spending about $2,000 a year. Uh, I guess they broke it down for about, uh, to work with 150 youth. That's very low. And that's not a whole lot of youth that they're working with. And if you read, I try to look at this, it's not clear exactly last year how many youth that they worked with. It's not clear of their age. And I think, I, I, can under, I don't have a problem in giving these organizations monies if they're really seriously um, trying to empower our young people and to help them. But I think, we would, I think it would be better to really try to get some more information I would like to know if any of these kids or young people are coming from the public housing area. We have several public housing. And Mr. Bell, I hope you will um, invite the new, um, the new public housing director. I hear we have a new one now. Uh, he really needs to be invited. Uh, but anyway, if somebody could add or, or, or explain uh, out of 100 and, uh, well, I guess it's about 150 youth, you know, why so low? the youth that they worked with last year, how are those kids doing? And Mr. Mayor, I did not get a chance to hear of, of your program, the youth, uh, summer youth program, which I think is very good. I wish that program was going all year round instead of just the summertime. Can you tell us uh, how many kids uh, the summer youth program will be putting to work this summer? It's, it's not someone just commented that it's not just for the summer, it's a year-round program. Okay, now it's uh, a year-round program? Yes, great. Youth opportunity. great. Do you want to speak to that, please? And how many uh, kids are? He, uh, yes, it's James Dickens with the Office of Economic and Workforce Development. Uh, you asked a couple of questions. So um, the number of um, students that we are, I, I can't answer about summer youth this year. Uh, we had 450 Yep, last year, and we'll serve about another 450 um, this year. Kids Is started that the work. Summer? That's the summer okay. program. They started um, today, as a matter of fact. Okay. And, and how about this program here? What, um, that is the um, Durham Yes program. Um, it's the WIOA federal funded program. Actually, last year we started with ages 16 to 24. So we do serve those, and they come from all over uh, the city and county. Uh, we do have students who live in the housing communities. Uh, we have students all over um, uh, the community. Uh, I'm gonna let uh, Coolidge Taylor, who's the program manager for the YES program, talk about some of the results from last year. Okay, Coolidge. Good evening. I'm Coolidge Taylor with Community Partnerships Incorporated, and I'm the program manager for the Durham YES program. Uh, in speaking to some of the results from our program, some of the things that we highlighted uh, to the Youth Council and to the Workforce Board were that we actually transitioned three separate families from homelessness living in their cars, young women with two children living in cars that are now have high school diplomas or GEDs are currently working, have been put through occupational skills training, and are living in their own housing. We've had four students last year that entered to college. So we have students at University of North Carolina Greensboro. We have students at North Carolina Central. We have uh, one student at NC State and one student at Durham Tech. Uh, and additionally, we've achieved 14 high school diplomas and uh, GEDs over the last year, as well as about 16 occupational skills uh, training certificates for the students. Well, I just would just like to say this, um, and I, I appreciate what you're doing for the kids in the community, but it does sound like that you're doing some things. So last year, our kids, there was 686 kids that were arrested in Durham. In Cora, these are the kind of programs where you put monies behind them to help 
because a lot of non-for-profits don't have these dollars. But if the city will put dollars in these kind of programs, we can salvage a lot of our young people instead of allowing them to go to prison and jail. So what I would like to see happen, instead of working with 150 kids, why don't you increase that? And I think the city needs to increase the dollar amount for these programs that are really producing. Ms. Peterson, thank you for your questions. And thank Staff, you. Thank you for your response. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Entertain a motion on item. Been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, we open the vote. We close the vote. Pass the seven to zero. Thank you. Let me ask other other items to come before Good the council. Item. Recognize the mayor. Dur program. During the uh, budget deliberations, um, a motion was made that we honor Veterans Day, and so the city has an additional holiday, and that is Veterans Day. I did ask the Harrison why they didn't make mention of it, and I didn't get an answer. But that's a very important um, announcement. Veterans will be honored by city, by the city this year. Thank you very much. Ask if there are other comments, questions before we adjourn for the month of June, hopefully July. Uh, no, for no further questions. Uh, meetings adjourn at 10, 12 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah.